Uh, Morena Koto Katoa, no mai ki tēnei hui o te Operations and Monitoring Committee, nga mihinui koto. Um, welcome to our meeting this morning of the 3rd of March. Just a reminder, this meeting is being live streamed. We do have um, a few people joining us via Zoom today, so um, I'd let them know if you do have a question, just raise your hand and we'll put you in the line for the list of questions. Um, Please also a reminder to have your mobile phones on silent and we will take the morning break um, around about 11am and lunch around about 12.30. Um, I would like to ask Councillor Maxwell to please open up Ahui with a karakia. Thank you, Madam Chair. Tūtahi ke te mihi o ki a koe anaru. No mai haere mai ki tēnei te whare o te koni era. Ke te mihi, ke te mihi. He ino i tātou, he te atu a whakatū whera te a mai ki a mātou ngā kuaha o te teka, o te pono, o te māramatangi i tēnei wā i ngā wā katoa. Ko i hukraiti hukui te mai te kaiwhakaora. Amen. May the grace of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and evermore. Amen. Kia ora koutou. Amen. Kia ora, Councillor Maxwell. I'd like to call for apologies and note that I have apologies from Jennifer, Jennifer Rothwell and Councillor... Oh, he's here. Um, and I do just want to note that our Chief Executive Jeff is in a Future for Local Government meeting um, at the moment. So uh, by my side, I have JD, our Deputy Chief Executive for District Development, um, to assist with the meeting. So were there any other apologies for this morning? There appear to be none. May I have a mover and a seconder for the motion that apologies from Jennifer Roth will be received. Moved by Councillor Yates, seconded by Councillor Donaldson. All those in favour, please say aye. Thank you. Any declarations of interest this morning? There appear to be none. Any urgent items on the agenda? Councillor Kumar? Madam Chair, it's not an urgent item, but just wanted to let you know that I have got a cough and that's the result of my hay fever. So it's just niggling, it just keeps dropping. But if anybody feels uncomfortable, I'm happy to go back in outside and go on Zoom. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for noting that, Councillor Krim. I think a few people are suffering from hay fever at the moment. Um, Councillor Bentley, did you have a urgent item for us this morning? It's not going to be classified as an urgent item, but I want an update on what's happening down at the lakefront with the stench that is emanating from there and what we intend to do about it if we get someone to give us a a brief report on that, what our, what our um, plan of attack is. Great, thank you, Councillor Bentley. Very topical, and uh, fortunately, we do have our manager, Rob Tesley, here in the room who will cover that off in a bit more detail, and I believe with a presentation um, in the operational report. So, uh, that will come. There appear to be none. Um, we'll now move to operations. Um, that the minutes of the Operation Monitoring Committee meeting be confirmed as true and correct. Record, we are on page six. Moved by Her Worship the Mayor, seconded by Councillor Yates. Any corrections to the minutes? There appear to be none. All those in favour, please say aye. Thank you, carried. And now we move into our staff reports. So we're going to kick off today with our InfraCall uh, group. I first would like a mover and a seconder that the report operational update from InfraCall Limited be received. Move Councillor Donaldson, seconded by Mr Hurd. Thank you. All those in favour, please say aye. And we'll head over to you, Pat, who's zooming in and also has a PowerPoint presentation for us this morning. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here all bit via Zoom today to report on the uh, financial year 22, quarter two, um, for InfraCorp Limited. It's uh, my absolute delight to be able to report that we were awarded uh, uh, the Tompkins Wake Business Awards winner for Employer of the Year 2021. Um, as uh, an incredible milestone, I feel, for, for the InfraCorp business and, and the journey that it has travelled. Um, it's particularly meaningful, I think, for 
for us as an organisation to, to be able to take that award as recognition of all the changes that have been made over the last two and a half years and, and the hard work and effort by the team. So I'd also like to say congratulations to Hayes as well. We were a double finalist. We were up against um, for the Health and Safety Award, which we, we didn't take, but Hayes did, so cool. All, uh, kudos to them for that one. And also, thank you to the, the sponsors and organisers of the Business Awards who persevered through very difficult and challenging times for a number of different um, fakes and, and eventually on, on the Zoom Awards, which was is very much appreciated. Well done to them. Moving on to page three, also um, also delighted to say that the previously reported journey in Precaus Travel for the ISO 9001 accreditation has actually been achieved. Um, this is a particularly important milestone for us because it demonstrates it demonstrates that we have a world class quality management system. It demonstrates that we understand the contracts that we're holding and the deliverables upon them. Um, and the processes and, and documentation that sits behind that. It's a great confidence builder for our key stakeholders. And that starts at the top with the, with the shareholder through the directors and then down to the management team. Uh, particularly pleasing and a, an awful lot of work by team people and capability in the infracore business. Moving on to the, to the other highlights. Um, Infocore has been awarded four new work programs in the water, in the water utilities, um, totaling around about 100k per annum. Includes uh, water main and scale valve flushing programs, mains inspections, pressure control and valve inspections, and pack flow testing. Our HSE indicators are, are strong, driven by the continual focus on the health, safety and wellbeing engagement at all levels through business. So that starts off at the top with the executive leadership team, moves down to the, to the senior management team and also the, the frontline managers. The review of our HR structure has been completed um, and that puts us into a position where, where we're now a better place to be able to proactively um, look at our business, the people development, uh, the future capabilities that are required and, and get our plan in place for delivering those outcomes to our people. And also on the, on the HR front as well, this is the second year that Infocore has had an internal program. This year we went with um, an, an HR intern, which we worked in collaboration with Nazi Fakari Distributions and Initiatives team and uh, the lucky candidate started an eight week program just before Christmas um, and that's just coming to an end now. It's been particularly successful and it, it's given the, the candidate a real life view of what the HR world looks like in an operational business. It's particularly good. As far as the KPIs, the statement of intent KPIs, um, all deliverables are strong opportunity in a, in a couple of fronts. The financial report is currently sitting behind budget, albeit forecasted to meet budget for the financial year. The reason for that is the, the timing on the capital projects and uh, in some cases reducing work on it due to the COVID, um, the COVID lockdown that reduced the work that Infocorp was undertaking for that period. There's a lost threat of opportunity. Um, the HS, HSE engagement is green, as I say, and the social enterprise report with KPIs is 100%. Now, that includes um, working with resourcing channels through MSD and corrections. Um, and a number of people have come in through those, through those channels over the last reporting period. The ISO 9001 achievement does report as green, which was a key, uh, key KPI for us in the first audit, which is that after year one would be uh, planned for July. Looking at the challenges, uh, Infocore, as all businesses during this time, does have challenges, and I think that we should be quite upfront about that. COVID-19, obviously, and for everybody, um, is tiresome. It does take its toll on the resources and our employees 
and there is an element of fatigue with it. The constant change, um, you know, every time there's a, a change of traffic light uh, or uh, you know, the processes that need to be undertaken in general, sort of in general life, people become unstable with that. Um, I think it's fair to say that uh, you know, a high percentage of people become derailed by it. And that's something that concerns us and something that we have to keep a very close eye on, provide support for our employees to make sure that they're okay, not just at work, but also in their private lives as well. High inflation is something that is, is staring us in the face. The, the cost of um, the cost of materials, the cost of goods in general, and the increased expectation, I suppose, on, uh, on the need for higher wages, the pressure from the unions to, to move to the living wage, um, and then obviously there's the, the revenue rates that we receive and the capability to be able to deliver the, to that expectation. The great resignation, as, as it's been dubbed throughout the world, is impacting on us. People are leaving. They're not leaving for other jobs necessarily. They're not, not necessarily leaving just for more money. Um, but lifestyle changes, people's expectations on on what their lives look like, what they expect in their lives, um, and, and you know what they want from their workplace uh, are changing internationally. It's, and it's something that is, I guess, something that all businesses need to face and and, and accept. We are looking now. Now that we've got our HR structure in place, we're, we're creating our HR strategy, our people strategy that looks at not just the, um, the recruitment strategies and how we entice people to work for Intercorp and the benefits that we offer, but also the retention. And I think the retention is, is critical. Understanding what people do expect, what they do need in their lives from their employment versus perhaps what they've needed traditionally and the, and the changes, the change in expectation around that. As far as the work planned over the next three months, um, we're currently in the implementation stage of Microsoft 365. Um, that's a, a fantastic platform that in, in a business where we have most of our people working out, out on the road, um, it provides for us an incredibly strong um, platform to operate mobility devices and importantly to get our communications out to all staff in real time. Traditionally, we've used emails. Now, emails um, are challenging for people. They don't get opened at the right time. Sometimes they get missed. What we will have with Office 365 is real-time alerts going out to people that show them um, any key communications that we need to deliver to them at, at that point. It also um, provides us with uh, cloud, um, cloud storage and cloud systems, so it supports remote working far better than the current sort of BPI system that we've got currently. It allows us to be dynamic at times where you know we need to go into isolation, work from home or work remotely. We can do that at a drop of a hat with minimum prepara minimum preparation just by logging onto onto the web. And it also provides us with a rather nice intranet which is called the core um, and that becomes the hub where we log on to each morning. It's got the links to everywhere we need to go in the business. Um, it allows us to do news updates, it allows us to um, access all of the files that we need to access, including the field staff and their, their um, standard operating procedures, incident reporting, etc. etc. We have our staff engagement survey planned for May. Um, we've seen over the last two years that our engagement has grown year on year. Um, this year will be interesting to see, um, not just from an import perspective, but you know, as I alluded to, where people are at and their expectations on their employment um, and the impacts that COVID and the related challenges has had upon them. We also plan over the next three months an expansion of our MSD and corrections recruitment channels. Um, that is something that's been built upon over the last three months. Um, and in a constrained employment market where it's very difficult to get resources, that offers, uh, you know, that offers uh, an extra opportunity. 
although in fairness it probably doesn't talk to the higher skill graphs um, in the way that we would like. And last but not least, uh, we have received a letter of intent from, from RLC. Uh, the process is that InfoCor take the letter of expectation, sorry, um, and we deliver our statement of intent. So uh, we're currently drafting our statement of intent um, for presentation to Council on the 1st of April. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. Were there any questions um, for the InfraCore report? Your Worship, the Mayor. Congratulations, Matt, on the Business Award. Uh, it was a thrill to be at the virtual ceremony uh, to see one of our CCOs uh, be an award winner. And congratulations to you and the team. Uh, just my question is, uh, with the social good, um, because we're not too worried about the other metrics in this COVID environment that we know are tough for you and not business as usual. But um, I can see with the nursery, you've got um, a contract with MSD and then you talk also about corrections. And um, I wondered if there's a place at that nursery with so much potential for it being a hub for community gardens um, you know, where people can, it's, it's easy access um, and you can drop off and collect stuff and I feel we could do so much more with sustainable backyards and um, it's something that in the food security that we're facing in the future and shortage of supplies of food, I think if we can help our community grow more of their own produce uh, that they can feed their families with we're going to be really stepping into that space rather than just some staff from MSD and some staff for the CBD gardens for corrections. So I'd love your response to that potential. It wasn't in the statement of intent. Yeah, look, I, I, there, there is opportunity there. Um, it's certainly something that we, we can explore in conjunction with, uh, in conjunction mm -hmm. with council. There is space. There is space on that uh, on that land there. Thanks, man. Thank you. We have Mr. Waru followed by Councillor Rokawate. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your uh, your report. Um, my my question is really based on more of the um, you know looking forward, looking into the future. Um, uh, you know, you mentioned it briefly, but you know, with this environment that we're in at the moment, are there things um, cooking, I suppose, in the kitchen um, in order to get, get things going moving forward? And um, in terms of council, are we helping, you know, seeing as you are a CCO of council, um, well, well, of course, um, you know, how could we best position uh, us, I'm talking about the council, in order to help the mahi that's going on with InfraCore for a better future. Thank you. Um, for sure. The, the, the future, um, I mean, the, I guess there's, there's a couple of things that are essential for the future, for, for any future, and that is certainty of work, longevity of work, uh, the opportunity for growth of revenue, i.e. more work, and also the rates that you're being paid for the work to sustain the future position and allow all of the, um, the objectives of the business as outlined in the letter of expectation to be delivered. In your view, or oh, sorry Madam Chair, uh, just if you would involve me, uh, in your view, would, would, is there, are there things that we could do, I mean, could the Council do to help towards that, to contribute towards that, uh, that goal. Very, very much so, very much so. Um, the, the work that we're currently undertaking um, needs a, a longer view, I feel. Um, and you know, the, the way in which the CCO is used to deliver the outcomes for the council could certainly be reviewed um, and, and supported for those future outcomes. 
Thank you, Matt. And just uh, me and Louis Gakwe, I know I've got a, a lot of relations that work uh, at Umpapo and, um, and they're very appreciative of, of the efforts you're putting in to try and uh, make sure there's money there for them to do. Mami and Louis Gakwe. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. We have uh, Councillor Rokawatate followed by Councillor Yates and then Councillor Maxwell. Thank you. Uh, Morena, Matt. Um, a few questions I have. Um, first of all, in RLC's letter of intent, uh, was there any surprises uh, from Infracor's perspective to that letter of intent? And secondly, um, how soon do you think you can progress to have um, all of the staff at least on the living wage? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no, no surprises on the, on the letter of expectation. Um, I, I think that it's not dissimilar to last year, but I think the response needs to be slightly different. Um, so, yeah, it isn't a cut and paste, and it, it isn't just a repeat. There's a lot of thought going into the into the response um, and exploration how to how we can deliver those outcomes in, in maybe in a slightly different way in a, a more commercial way that makes it sustainable, that allows the social elements to be delivered thereafter. Um, as far as, sorry, was the second, could you repeat the second question? It was just around the living wage, I know where the union... A uh, living wage, yeah, yes. sorry. Um, the living, the living wage is, is, is something that I, I personally support, it's something that I aspire to be able to deliver in Infracorp. Um, However, we need to look at the, the commercial practicalities. Um, there's obviously an increased cost to that structure. Uh, the inc increased cost isn't just the lowest rate, it moves through the whole of the, uh, the wage structure under the collective agreements. Um, and that's why it has to be so carefully considered. But from my perspective, as a CEO of the business, I would fully support it and would dearly love to move to it. Thank you. Councillor Yates, followed by Maxwell and Bentley. See you now, Matt, and you might see my hand just kind of yeah. waving out there. That's a wave to say congratulations. Uh, tino hi kakaho, uh, ki te rongo ki a koutou i whaka i huwaka i taua, um, i taua uh, pō. So yes, uh, I, was, I was just um, so excited to hear that um, one of our CCOs took out that, that top prize, so Nada Tindahi Kia Koto. Uh, just around the partnering with Tiarua and Mana Whenua, a couple of questions I have. The first one is, who in particular is Nati for Koe Distributions? Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> we were put onto there by one of our directors, through to Father Morrison. Um, I, uh, they're a, a, an EV entity is, is uh, the best that I can describe it. That's okay. And uh, secondly, just on that point, I tried to do a little bit of a research myself, but I couldn't find the answer to that one, so I thought I'd ask you. Uh, second one is, is there further potential, whilst this is an eight-week paid position, is there further potential for this to be increased in number um, and also extended into the future? Yes, there, there is. The position has actually been extended for a three-month period. Um, so the internship comes to an end at the end of this week, in fact, uh, and three months extension has been offered on for that. So as far as um, future opportunities for, for interns or others, for short periods of time to gain experience into the business, yes, that is an opportunity. Thank you. Excellent. Councillor Maxwell. Uh, more than I'm at. Um, the question I've got is on page 17. Um, down the, oh, but before I ask the question, also I'd like to, with my colleagues, say congratulations on the Rotary Business Awards. I was thrilled to hear that. Um, also, I take the opportunity to also congrat to uh, acknowledge uh, a member of our O&M committee. Um, and Mr. Hurd, who ran an excellent, excellent um, award session in very challenging times. Kill it. Um, the one I have is, is what's going to be happening in between January, March, 
or again in March 22. First bullet point, the work is being planned to review the contract with MSD in order to get leverage gains from what we've done up to date. And you've always been supportive of this program. Um, can you for me or, uh, just expand a little about what you hope to um, add to this program that you've already successfully run in the past? Yeah. So uh, originally we signed a nine-month contract, which was based upon a 12-month contract to bring people in for nine months, uh, two people to bring them in, uh, provide certain pre-agreed um, training packages uh, and qualifications and outcomes plus some experience. And then at the end of that nine month period, if there was a vacancy, um, then they would be considered for that vacancy. Um, that two positions turned into three positions. All three of those people never actually made it to the end of the nine month period because they uh, they applied for positions that gave them more longevity, right? So, um, which is a positive. Right? So, in collaboration with MSD, we we said, well, you know, let's explore this. If, if we've got three people and they're not making it to the end of the nine month program, they're they're finding themselves in full time employment. How can we work in another way to forget the nine months and just bring people in on a on a permanent basis? So the, it's not finalised at this point, but the the, um, the process will be based upon meeting with a pool of people that are work ready, if you like, um, and we will, myself and my executive team, will present the opportunities with Infocore and what Infocore has to offer them as an employee. Um, then they will fill out an expression of interest for, or any of the vacancies or opportunities that we have. And at that point, we will conduct the, the interview process. So in other words, by the time we get to have a serious discussion about it, they know what the business is about, they know what the opportunity is, they know how that fits with their expectations, and therefore the success rate of the interview should be very high and the success of the employment that follows should follow that positive pathway. So yeah. Currently, numbers, talk to, talk to numbers, um, we're looking at 12 people in 12 months. 12. Or over the 12 months. But Thanks. full-time, full-time employment, not, not fixed home. Thank you, that would be very exciting. We'll now go to Zoom to Councillor Bentley and then we'll have Mr Hurge and last question we'll go to Councillor Kumar. Over to you Peter. Thank you very much. Um, question from Matt. With regard to the lakefront at the moment with that um, extension was there, I, I did the planning of the council um, um, in a city area for 15 years and we had probably five different occurrences where we had a weed build-up such as we have at the moment and it was up to us to get rid of it very, very quickly as, as soon as the weather became suitable and this is not something that um, our support seems to be responsible for anymore. I'm just wondering what your comment is on that and whether we can see an improvement over the years as this hugely expensive lakefront redevelopment draws to conclusion. Yeah, uh, it, it isn't, uh, it isn't wholly under Infocore's uh, contracted services to maintain that position. We do on a daily basis. What we're experiencing at the moment is a result of a storm um, and my understanding is that it's the first time that we've experienced such a storm with the, with the New formed later front. Um, we have worked in conjunction with council on the clearing of of the said week, um, but it isn't a it's not a shortfall of infrastructure that that week is there. Answer to your question. Thank, thank you for clarifying that, Matt. And we will get um, some more information from Rob in the operational report shortly. Um, so we'll go to Mr. Hurd now. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Matthew, I'm hiding around the corner, you can't see me, but there's my hand too. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to throw you a bouquet um, because it's not often you get the chance to do something like this, but not just because of the business awards, but because as a rural user of your services, uh, on two or three occasions in recent months, I've had a cause to call in for call because of whatever, water supply, storm damage, you name it, and the level of responsiveness and going over and above uh, with the help has been quite notable, so well done. Something's going on there. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you. And final question from Councillor Kumar. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, Matt. Matt, my question is probably superficial and you're probably already engaged in them, but I see you have a very extensive staff engagement program as working with Nadi Fakawi and also with the um, MSC as well. But I just wondered, as, as an uh, CCO, um, are you an equal opportunity employer for the disability sector as well? Knowing that some of the jobs the disability sector can take, but in the office space and, and other environments also are uh, uh, in Foucault? Uh, we're, we're certainly an equal opportunities employer. Um, we, you know, many of our, many of our roles are obviously operational roles. Um, but yeah, I mean, a can to us, a candidate is a candidate, and, and considered on their own attributes. Um, we're an equal opportunities employer for sure. Thank you. Well, that concludes our presentation uh, for InfraCore. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, the congratulations to you and the team has been well deserved uh, this morning. So uh, please pass that on to your management team and thank them for the excellent work that they're doing uh, for our staff but ultimately to make sure that we're servicing our community to an excellent standard with happy people. So thank you very much, Matt. We'll move thank to you. our yeah. operational report for the Rotorua Airport Limited now. May I please have a mover and a seconder that the report um, be received. Moved by Councillor Maxwell, seconded by Councillor Kumar. All those in favour, please say aye. Thank you. Now I welcome uh, Peter Stubbs and Nicole Brewer um, who are joining us through Zoom and it is such a pleasure to have you guys and a very warm welcome and a welcome back to Nicole. Over to you guys. Thank you uh, Madam Chair Tēnā Koutou Katoa and just before um, Nicole uh, speaks to the report could I just take the opportunity to publicly welcome Nicole back to uh, the airport. We had 50 applications for uh, the role of Chief Executive when Mark Gibb left and Nicole, Nicole got to the top of a, what was a very extensive interview process. The board felt that Nicole's long involvement in passenger aviation plus his pre previous experience at, as CEO uh, made her the right choice. So we're absolutely delighted and from a personal perspective having uh, been involved in hiring Nicole in the first place I'm absolutely delighted to welcome her back. So with that introduction, um, Nicole, if you'd like to proceed with our report. Thank you very much. So I'll take the main report as read a, as just a further note to what Peter said. It's great to be back. I'm really enjoying being at the airport. Um, I feel like I've got my hit the ground running and come back full seat. So I'm really enjoying being back and great to be here. Um, I will take the main report as being read and just go through, hopefully you've got the PowerPoint that we sent through in advance. Um, up there, I'm not sure how it works Zoom as well. Um, and I'll just talk through the key highlights of that. So basically on the financial performance, the impact of COVID-19 basically means that our net surplus before depreciation is behind budget. Um, clearly in the first half of the year, there was the um, Auckland lockdown for several months, um, quite a drop in passenger numbers. The nation nationwide lockdown for a few weeks as well. It's had a big impact on passenger numbers. We lost the Auckland service for a period um, and that that has impacted on, on the bottom line. Uh, well, on the surplus before depreciation. Something that Peter instigated a while ago was for the airport to review the way that depreciation was handled at the airport on some of our key infrastructure such as the runway. That has been reviewed and this is I reiterate, this is a process that has happened over a couple of years. It's not just coincidence and it's just coincidence that it happens to have happened when we're, you know, slightly behind financially. So 
the way that depreciation has been handled on the runway is has changed, and as a result, the depreciation number has dropped because the basically the base cost of the runway has been treated as a lifelong asset. Because of that, our net surplus after depreciation is ahead of budget and we expect it to remain ahead of budget for the remainder of the year. Um, and passenger numbers are ahead of budget for the first half of the year, however, they weren't quite ahead of what, what they could have been and we expect to see something similar for the, um, for the second half of the year as well. Probably very important to note, cash flow, there is no issue. We're not having, despite the fact that we're behind um, behind on a net surplus before depreciation, there are no cash flow issues at the airport. We um, have got no issues remaining operational and being operational obviously at the moment is our key focus. So um, while the numbers we are expecting to post a loss, um, it is it is well within the means of the airport and it has been budgeted for, so it, 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 there's no issues there. On non-financial performance, everything's on track. There have been no major safety issues and there are no, no issues there at all. I touched on it before, but the outlook for FY22, um, on the 1st of January this year, we implemented new pricing structure within New Zealand, and that sees a significant upside in revenue for the airport. However, some of that revenue upside will be eroded by the lower passenger numbers due to Omicron and the red, current red setting. Um, we're hopeful that, well, after the peak, that this will start to, to bounce back, but obviously none of us yet know exactly what that's going to look like. So while we're getting strong revenue upside, we're also getting the impact of COVID, which is balancing that out somewhat as well. Um, so as I said, the net surplus for FY22 is expected to be ahead of budget, primarily because of that change in depreciation. And also another looking forward for the next six months, Peter's has made it very clear to me that the strategic projects that the airport has on, on its plate are, are a key focus for me, and they are. So I've got Basically, two key focuses at the moment. One is remaining operational in COVID time, and we're continually changing and updating our processes in line with, um, with new information that's coming through and managing the situation as it unfolds here at the airport. We have had two members test positive for COVID in the last week. Um, however, they weren't at work, there was no exposure at work, and we have been able to manage that without any uh, significant impact on the airport. And we've got, we are comfortable that we have enough um, robustness built into our planning that we can manage these things without, without any issues. So remaining operational and the strategic projects that we've got on our plate are the key issues, key focuses for me at the moment over the next six months. Um, so the last slide, um, yep, so just talking about what we're doing with COVID to give you a reassurance that um, that we've got got it under control. So obviously the airport is a lifeline utility and as such is a critical service. That means that we, our workers or the majority of our workers, including myself, are regarded as critical workers under the close, well, what was the close contact exemption scheme. Now is effectively the household contact exemption scheme. However, we are all, we, while we have the ability to use that uh, scheme, we are also using it with caution to ensure that we're limiting any risk to the airport. Uh, we're continually adapting to the current situation and remaining operational is our number one priority. We're confident that we've got good procedures in place and that's exactly why I'm, why I'm sitting here on Zoom today rather than being with you face to face and again limiting other contact unless it's absolutely necessary. Uh, to ensure that we remain operational here at the airport. That's the key focus for us. Um, if you have any questions, Peter and I would be happy to take them. Thank you very much, Nicole. We've got a first question from Councillor Donaldson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Through you, uh, Kia ora and welcome back, Nicole. Great to see you back here. Um, my question was going to be around 
the um, review of the way depreciation is handled and um, I think you've explained that pretty well but I just missed uh, through the speaker um, on, on the Zoom there uh, what initiated that review? Could you remind us, please? Sorry, Lee, you don't answer that question, Peter? Yeah, sure. I, I think that um, uh, the, the initial thinking was that uh, the way in which depreciation was calculated was a fairly rough tool. And um, because depreciation is a fairly important component of our financial result, I wanted to see whether there were more sophisticated and nuanced ways in which we can, in which we could uh, record uh, depreciation. So we did some work over the last couple of years uh, in order to take, a, as I say, a more nuanced and sophisticated approach, which would have the result in uh, us taking a, uh, a better, uh, more asset by asset approach in terms of the way in which we deal with those assets, the way in which we manage those assets over time, the purpose of which was to look to drive down the depreciation number. Thank you very much. Your Worship, the Mayor. Um, welcome, Nicole. It's lovely to have you back, and uh, congratulations. That was a very big field of, field of applicants, so well earned, um, and a great decision, Peter. Uh, and my question is probably to you, Peter, because you were before the Select Committee on the Civil Aviation Bill. Um, how did you get received there, and do you think we got our message across as to how important Rotorua is as a regional asset and regional airport? So, um, thank you, Your Worship. I, um, I was scheduled to appear, but... Um, I had an accident, uh, which is, I think, probably the result of advancing age, uh, and uh, so um, I was lucky that our general manager of assets and infrastructure, together with uh, the company's lawyer from uh, Holland Beckett, were able to attend in my stead. I'm told that it was uh, the presentation was well received. That um, one of the key points that we were looking to make was uh, that. Uh, it's important that the Airports Association be understood as representing all of the airports of the country. But of course, the airports of New Zealand consists of, broadly speaking, Tier 1 airports, of which we are not, and Tier 2 airports, of which we most certainly are. And we wanted to make a number of observations uh, as a Tier 2 airport and, if you like, as representative of some of the smaller regional airports. And our issues are, are, are much, uh, are somewhat different to the issues that, uh, uh, that tier one airports face. So um, I'm told that that difference was better understood by the select committee and that uh, we received a, a good and respectful hearing. And I'm also told that there was um, uh, that the, the select committee was pleased that a tier two airport took the time to make a submission to reflect on the needs of regional airports. Certainly from my perspective, um, respecting and reflecting the needs of regional airports rather than just relying upon uh, an airport association which tends to be dominated by tier one airports was very important in terms of our advocacy on behalf of the of the city and the ratepayers who, of course, own this airport. Just subsequent, if I can, because this is a critical issue about placing Rotorua in our long-term future. Were we the only Tier 2 airport that did present to the Select Committee? Because you showed leadership before on, on our previous uh, strategy. Uh, were we showing that leadership again? Regrettably, uh, we were, Your Worship. Um, uh, one of the things that, uh, before Nicole started, I directed um, Logan to do as the acting chief executive was to share our draft submission with our colleagues, both at the Airport Association and also our Tier 2 colleagues, in the hope that um, some of them might uh, join in the submission, make their own submission, or at least um, uh, provide a sentence in support of the submission. Um, uh, for reasons that uh, I'm not aware of, um, none of the others did that, but um, nevertheless, 
I think it's our responsibility to make sure that the select committee, and, and no one knows better the importance of select committees than you, that uh, the select committee understood that there were a range of interests and uh, views and perspectives that needed to be taken into account and that the airport sector is not just one uh, sector with a singular set of issues. Peter, because certainly when we're preparing ourselves for the opening of um, international tourism, we have to be um, right up there as a premier destination, and, and the asset of the airport was so um, so sensitively poised in the past, so it's great that you presented. Well done. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Councillor Wang. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Peter, and thank you, Nicole, and it's great to um, meet you for the first time. Um, my question was just around the, uh, general, uh, the general aviation movement, and because of the closure of the flight training school um, and the reduction in the Ardmore flying school, is there a plan um, that the Rotorua Airport has to attract more of the general aviation movement? Yes, so we currently... Looking at general aviation and how we um, manage general aviation is obviously something that we do at the airport all the time. And with the flying schools, it's more around movement, so they would do touch and goes and use our facilities in that way. Um, obviously, flying schools in the current environment are a completely different beast than the one in Hamilton to shut up shop and took all their planes back to Singapore. One of the strategic projects that we have on the cards and we are pushing quite hard on at the moment is the hangar precinct to the north of the airport. Uh, where we've got some, some, a few hangars now, we're looking at expanding that. And as part of that, we are really reconsidering how we handle general aviation and how that is managed at the airport. And by um, creating more more facilities and more drive to the general aviation, it's also hoped that we will create more traffic through general aviation as well. So as it starts returning, um, that we're well captured, we're well positioned to capture that. So, yeah, as far as specific flight training schools, um, we don't have a plan specifically around flight training schools. However, we do have a, a, um, a plan and focus, one of our strategic projects. The aim is to, is to build general aviation and then also um, increase revenue to the airport through that. Cool, thank you. And my second quick question was just around sustainability and whether or not um, now that uh, with your new role uh, there is any look into uh, renewable energy uh, for the airport? Um, so it's not one of my key priorities right at this moment. However, having said that, sustainability is something that we need to look at right through everything that we do, including the, the hangar design and the build, um, ensuring longevity and that everything's the best we can. We have been looking at sort of uses of alternative energy such as solar and that's on, ongoing. Um, and as I said, sustainability, it, it is a focus, it's not one of the main focuses right at the moment, but it is definitely something that we've got on our radar and will fold into everything as we, and when we can. Thank you. Thank you very much, and too right, because not only can you get environmental benefits, but also economic as well through cost savings. Um, so there appears to be no other questions. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Peter, for your leadership in advocating for Aotearoa Airport and regional travel. And another warm welcome to you, Nicole. We look forward to having your skills and experience on board the team, uh, leading a very important asset for us. Thank you very much to you both. Thank you, Madam Chair. So we now move to our CCO Rotorua Economic Development Limited. Um, we welcome Andrew Wilson back to the table. And I'd like a mover and a seconder to receive the report, please. Moved by Ms. Bray, seconded by Councillor Yates. All those in favour, please say aye. Oh. Over to you, Andrew. Aye. Good morning. I think I've got a presentation sitting there. Yep. So look, 
I'll take the report as being read um, and happy to take any questions on that at the conclusion of the presentation. Um, look, really pleased to be in front of you this morning to be able to give you the, um, the first public view of our, our new destination brand. So um, before I kind of rip into it, just wanted to make a couple of uh, just opening remarks. Um, look, it's been a really challenging past couple of years, um, no doubt. And uh, we're still confronting a, a number of challenges that are really impacting our reputation. And I think we do need to acknowledge that. Um, the work on our destination brand looks beyond us. Um, you know, I've no doubt that will, these current challenges that we're facing um, will be overcome, they're temporary. Um, and we must continue to be strategic and ensure we're well positioned for the future. So I guess just keep that context in mind. Um, it's been a bit of a journey to get there. So, look, we've been beavering away pretty much since COVID first lockdown, actually, um, following some feedback we had from industry that, um, that they didn't feel that what, what the campaign activity that we had at the time was, uh, was reflecting um, who we were as a, as a place. Um, and so we really took the time to make sure that we're, who are we and answer that sort of set of questions and, and really understand and distill what our kind of core brand um, is. So that slide there just represents the journey. Um, we've uh, certainly consulted with a really wide range of stakeholders um, to define what makes Rotorua a special place to um, live, work and visit. Um, we've placed a real emphasis on consulting with uh, representatives from Te Arawa throughout the process and the, and the brand um, certainly reflects that um, and reflects the uni unique nature of the destination um, as well as Te Arawa's, uh, view for the future. Um, everything we do to promote the destination is now linked to a single uh, defining idea. Um, it's all found within. Um, now that's not a tagline. We don't do taglines anymore. Taglines are something which are in the past. Um, this is very much about making sure that uh, when we are thinking about how we're building or, or promoting the destination, um, that we challenge, it challenges us to always look below the surface, searching for those deeper stories, the more meaningful experience, experiences, and putting our people at the centre. Um, so that kind of got us to you know, pretty much uh, about the late last year when we kind of got to a place where we said, yep, we've, we've landed all of that piece of work. Um, what we didn't have at that stage was a, a really visual um, kind of cue in terms of how we bring that to life. Um, we looked obviously at um, some of the most well-known destination brands around the world, so those logos will look pretty, um, <laughs> pretty um, reflective or pretty uh, familiar to you. Um, often they're based on physical structures, as you can, um, as you can see. Um, and certainly none of them ever have a, um, a, sl a slogan or tagline that goes um, alongside it. Um, our design guys um, worked alongside uh, Stacey Gordine and Araya Keel from um, up at New Zealand Māori Arts and, and uh, Crafts Institute uh, to develop a tohu um, or a symbol that represents our city. And so you can kind of um, there you can get a little bit of a a little bit of insight in terms of the work that they did and the and the process they they went through. Um, I will say that there were pages and pages and pages and pages of, uh, of drawings that um, led us to the to the final um, to the final uh, design. And so there you have it, um, sitting in, in uh, between obviously what was the um, the key inspiration for um, the design of the tofu. So uh, obviously the geyser and the sculpture, um, you know, and really kind of thinking about how that kind of got brought to life in terms of a really distinctive um, and unique design. Um, there's a lot of symbolism in it. So as you kind of look at it a little bit more deeply, you'll note that the, the eight points uh, represent the eight beating hearts of, of uh, Te Arawa. Uh, the 18 lakes around this district are, are represented in the droplets. Um, and it has a real sense of uh, energy and movement. Um, and best of all, it all comes from the within. Um, it comes from our own, uh, our own designers. So that's the final uh, mock-up of it. Um, and certainly the, the and I should also point out that even the text below it is our own text. It's been specifically created. We own it. Uh, it's not uh, something that you can kind of go online and, and uh, uh, type into to Word. Um, so yeah, it will be um, distinctively our place. 
Um, as we think about where we go next, um, one of the things we've been reflecting on is um, what does kind of best practice look like in terms of how do we make sure that we bring this brand to life and we maximise the value of it. Um, we've looked at um, obviously a number of places but um, Melbourne's journey is a, is a really good one in terms of giving you a bit of a view about what best practice could look like. Um, over on the left hand side of the screen there you can, get, you can see where they were and obviously all of those little logos down the bottom represented all of the different kind of facilities and, and uh, events and so forth that um, you know, were all kind of independently branded um, across the, the city of Melbourne. Um, obviously post um, them kind of getting a bit more unified and, and a bit more organised in terms of the way they view things, uh, they've moved to a far more kind of structured uh, you know, um, brand uh, architecture um, and you can really get that sense in terms of everything relates back to, um, to the city of Melbourne. Um, this is obviously um, where we've been working um, quite closely with Una's team to sort of come up with a, you know, how would uh, that Rotorua, uh, you know, brand be deployed across all of the kind of the council brands um, from an events perspective. Um, look, that work's ongoing. It's not a, um, we're certainly not a, um, a spark where we can afford to have, uh, you know, 200 people run around overnight and, and replace all the signs around the city. Um, this will be something which takes a period of time as renewals occur, um, as we begin to think about projects being delivered. You know, how do we make sure we're, we're grabbing hold of that brand and reflecting it through in terms of, uh, in terms of um, how the city is presented? Um, this just gives you, I guess, a quick little snapshot in terms of how some of that visual identity will start to be rolled out. Um, I don't know, I think the airport guys have gone, they might um, shoot me if, uh, if they went and rebranded their beautiful new building, but um, anyway, it's a, nice, um, it's a nice example in terms of how we'd, we'd start to apply it. Um, up the top of that slide, um, you can kind of see, uh, I think it's, a little, it's hopefully it's sort of clear to you, you can get a an indication of how um, the brand can be used for something like a farmer's market or, or an event so it can be stretched out and utilised um, a little bit more broadly. But I'll leave it there and uh, happy to take questions. Thank you. You just want questions on the brand or on the report too? Uh, questions on the report as well. Yep. Okay. We'll open it up. Over to you, Your Worship. Well, I'm very excited when I see this, Andrew, and it is been a long time coming. I remember when we first got in, we looked at our imaging and we did a bit of a cut and paste job actually of the font and, and we did a cheap, but it was it lasted for a while. But it was always something that I think we weren't positioning Rotorua well, um, both nationally and internationally, now more importantly even internationally. This is wonderful. It's got so many stories woven within. Um, it's aspirational in terms of um, outward rising. And I think our community is going to need this hope and, and something to hold on to as we rebuild. Um, I'd just like to ask you, you, you have said publicly that our reputation's taken a bit of a smashing, uh, especially with our emergency housing and displaced people. Uh, but do you think a brand can actually help rebuild uh, what matters to us as locals about our reputation? We're doing everything else we can on the emergency housing fund, emergency housing approach, but the brand of Rotorua, you keep seeing it, I keep seeing it getting knocked, um, but this is very important about aspiration. Yes. Um, look, I've said a couple of times, I think now, and, and probably been quoted in the media a couple of times, that um, certainly our brand has taken a bit of a, well, our reputation, I would say, has taken a bit of a hit. Um, I think the brand actually kind of fits below that, and it's actually something which we've, we haven't done a good job of actually kind of really centering ourselves on and bringing through. Um, the, the, the symbol of this and the icon of it is certainly about looking to the future. You know, it is looking through all of the you know, the current kind of turmoil and, you know, what are some pretty, sh some pretty, you know, not a great situation we find ourselves in at the moment. Um, but we do need to look beyond that and, and certainly look to, um, you know, um, that this is a, um, and it has always been a really proud destination that has picked itself up a, a large number of times. But no doubt that it will do it again and this is really about sort of setting um, where we want to be into the future. And could you just comment on the links with the Tiaki promise? 
which is something that um, Sydney Tourism New Zealand was trying to promote right through our destination management plans. And I see some real um, links here too with Te Papa and their development there. So they're all sort of starting to tell our own stories from within. Yeah, look, I think the most important thing was to have something which was very distinctive, you know, and people can quickly see that this is Rotorua, you know, and actually when you kind of dig below it, um, you do get that sense of terms of, you know, what this place is all about. Yeah. What would your answer be to the knockers that say we shouldn't be spending money on a brand? Uh, look, I think, you know, if I kind of go back and say this again is about looking to the future, um, these are not things that you go back and replace um, very often, you know, and I think one of the reflections we had was when we looked back at our um, a lot of our previous kind of uh, tourism marketing work, um, it wasn't anchored in anything. Um, we had a whole lot of campaign work going on, um, but it really wasn't kind of um, anchored onto anything particularly kind of structural. So um, this gives us the ability to make sure that anything we're doing in terms of, you know, marketing or, uh, you know, project work really is kind of anchored off a, um, quite a strong foundation. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Wang followed by Councillor Donaldson and then Max. Sorry. Councillor Donaldson. Thank you, Madam Chair, through you. Um, <clears throat> congratulations, Andrew. I think it's, yeah. it's a, an a excellent uh, uh, icon that we have sitting up there on the screen. Um, and also congratulations on the appointment of Melissa Craig to implement the Destination Management yeah. Plan. Um, I uh, am ex excited to read the um, Sarah Bennett article um, endorsing the plan and the focus on sustainable tourism um, and, and being a sustainable destination. I think, I think that's great. So this brand will be front and centre in the implementation of the destination management plan, I take it? Yeah. Yep, um, through the chair, absolutely. And it is uh, certainly one of the yearly deliverables out of that destination management plan. Um, the challenge for us now is as we think about what the, the next kind of uh, round of marketing campaigns look like. We'll now be kind of building it off of this, um, which will be uh, certainly, if not in time for East, it'll be uh, soon after. So. Thank you. Councillor Kumar. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, Andrew. Andrew, uh, we have a couple of questions. One is um, regarding the branding. Um, congratulations on finding something that you think it might work. However, when you showed us before this, you showed us landmarks. And landmarks were synonymous to, when you see Paris, you think, oh, the symbol of love, you know. When you see the opera house, you think, oh, yeah, that's, you know, it all signifies what it stands for. Over here, it'll be really, I mean, this is wonderful. But when you come to Rotorua, what do people come to Rotorua for? The geysers, Maori culture. And this does signify Maori culture, but it, does it, will it, in, will this brain alone speak volumes in the future to come? Um, that's, that's my question. And, um, and it just depends on how we brand it, and that's very important, because um, it's like the swoosh. Very small, but in years to come, everybody has known what it meant. And my other question is, Red involvement in finding sector solutions for destinations like the closed Rainbow Springs. Okay, I'll take the first question first. So certainly it is actually um, symbolic of the geyser and Pahutu in particular. So I guess that's the first um, answer to that. So I think you're right in that um, most of those symbols that we showed are, are anchored off uh, quite an iconic kind of feature of each of those destinations, whether it was Table Mountain in Cape Town through to the Eiffel Tower in Paris. For us, the inspiration has very much been uh, the geyser in terms of uh, Pahutu. So um, hopefully that answers that one. Um, look, in terms of the, the sector uh, solutions, like it, you know, I think when I came to the last Operations and Monitoring Committee, um, we did talk about just how hard a lot of those uh, businesses are doing it. Um, the reality for a business like um, for a business like Rainbow Springs was, you know, it was pretty tough trading conditions even prior to um, to COVID in terms of the type of market that they were focused on. Um, 
I think at the end of the day they will um, they have made some strategic calls when they look at both of the businesses that they own in terms of that and Agridome and they'll they'll take some steps forward in terms of consolidating um, and we'll end up with a you know a better, higher quality product at the tail end of this. Um, we do work with a lot of individual businesses in terms of just helping them around, you know, what are their options. Um, where could they be thinking a little bit differently in terms of you know um, how their products presented, what that might mean in terms of the type of uh, in terms of the type of customers they might be seeking to, to attract, or the type of uh, revenue they'd be generating from that customer mix? Um, it's not a it's never an easy um, set of discussions, and I guess you know at the end of the day um, we need to be careful that we're not financial advisors. You know that's a, that's a very clear thing under the Financial Advisors Act. Um, and actually, you know, business people need to make a, a you know a rational business decision, decision in terms of what's best for them. Um, you know, and I think in that case, that's certainly what's happened. Thank you, Councillor Yates. Tina Kui Andrew. Nei rā te mihi mō tēnē o ngā pohu, kei runga rā. I do actually want to pick up on a point because I was fortunate enough alongside um, Councillor Kai Fong last year to get a sneak preview whilst it was still in draft form, so I was already prepared for this question. But my question around this is, now it's been brought to the table, is it was raised by our Mayor that it is very similar to Te Papa and the fingerprint there. And I love that. I love, I love the imagery. I love everything about what, what, um, what's been developed. But the similarity, what would your answer to that similarity be? In some ways, when we look, we've had the comment that some people say, hey, it looks like a fingerprint. Uh, and the answer is, that's great. You know, like if you're engaging with it and identifying it, fantastic. Um, actually, the more people that, that see something in it is actually um, is actually the best thing that we could hope for. Yeah. Great answer. Uh, final compliment, actually, if I may. Having been involved with Vax Vegas as well, that has just been a, a stellar effort. It's really brought our rangatahi and our fano across the line here in Dotara. So, me mihi ka tika kia koto. Kia ora. Kia ora. Miss Bray. Kia ora, Andrew. Uh, what a lovely surprise to see this. My son is at Iakil and uh, we talk about everything, but he didn't tell me about this, so um, I'm really excited. Yeah, really excited. Um, because we're now cashing in on something that's not just sitting there. And um, for me, yeah, I'm just blown away by that. And uh, also, I'm looking forward to someone developing some tours where we can take our locals and tourists when they come back around there because we need to keep that sculpture living. So thank you very much. Very nice, thank you. Councillor Jonathan followed by Councillor Rokawate. Thank you Madam Chair. Uh, Andrew, my uh, question is in the uh, area of relationships in your report. And I recall a comment of your former board chair that uh, Rotary Economic Development was the, um, the CIA, uh, so to speak or what's going on in our destination. And um, so <clears throat> I, I wanted to talk your approach to media relationships and not reacting to anecdotal information. We're all over our destination being uh, talked down. And, um, and so um, I just wonder how you say there have been positive implica implications. Are the media responding positively towards this approach? That's my question. Look, I can't speak for the media, and I, and I would never try to. But, um, but look, certainly, I think um, we've been quite clear that if um, if someone's asking us for a comment on a soundbite, um, that we won't. Um, that we will look to to try and investigate and, and inquire in terms of what the actual story is. Um, and as part of that, it's really just about us making sure that if we're going to run a story, that at least it's based on facts. We've got lots of data, and we're really happy to share the data. Um, and so that's certainly the, the direction of travel we've taken. Um, like I think we've got some really great relationships with, um, with some of the local media as well. You know, we're, we're more than happy to sit down and, and spend the time to talk them through things, um, but we're less inclined to want to just um, provide a, a quick soundbite to, um, to, you know, to, to a comment that's been made. Thank you. Councillor Rokolote. Um, thank you. Good morning, Andrew. Actually, that's very, really stunning up there, so of course it's, uh, I think it'll do the trick. But look, I just want to ask you, Andrew, when you're talking to businesses, 
who have experienced um, you know, hardship over the last couple of years, there is not unanimous sympathy in Rotorua for some of our tourism businesses. And I just wonder, are they aware of that? I mean, many people in our community believe that services and products were developed over many years for our visitors. And so um, locals are seen as the B team, um, you know, no consideration given to them. And I'm just wondering if when you're talking to businesses who are trying to, to reinvent themselves, do they realise that there is that, still that comment in the community and so they may have to look at um, having more regard for um, the purchasing dollar of the local community and not just the ones who may come back, and that's not going to be just overnight either, coming back within a very short time. It's going to take some time. So I just wonder, does, do the, does the business community and hospitality and tourism, do they clearly understand that, that they cannot show disregard for the local purchasing dollar as they possibly have in the past? Look, it's a good question. I think, um, in general, the, in, you know, there's always going to be exceptions to this. Uh, in general, when we talk to, to particularly our local tourism and hospitality businesses, they're hugely thankful um, for the local customers, um, and they're very appreciative in terms of Rotorua locals getting out there and supporting them. Um, I think, internally, in some instances, there are some businesses that will find it very hard to be able to, um, to meet what a local's expectation would be. You know, and it's just quite simply when you think about the way in which you know a product or experience is put together in terms of the cost of actually delivering that that, um, that product or experience. And I think in those instances, you do get a bit of uh, friction in terms of expectations. Um, but overall, certainly, uh, you know, the businesses I talk to, you know, they're, one, they're hugely appreciative of, of the locals. Most of them actually will. Um, you know, operate a, a local's rate um, and actually do discount their products because they recognise the importance of actually having, uh, you know, local people actually getting through and experiencing uh, what it is that they're, they're delivering. Um, I think the other observation to make about most of our, uh, you know, tourism and hospitality businesses in particular is we don't have a lot of big corporates here. They are generally uh, small to medium-sized businesses. They're owned by locals. They employ locals. Um, and so they, they, most of them are very, very well connected into, um, into the community from that perspective. Thank you. Councillor Maxwell. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I enjoyed reading um, your, the report that you provided for us. Um, I do want to also join my colleagues in the talking about the place brand and I think it's tr uh, I think it's terrific. It's not because I was on the panel that chose the original when there were twelve that went for it in New Zealand Murray Alpha Group Institute won it, but sadly in recent years it's not because of the Tohu, but it um, didn't receive some good uh, comments, but I think this lifts it. It really brings it back to life. And um, what I also want to say is the line to me, what I'm glad there's going to be no byline along there, full of surprises, feel the spirit. Those were good for the time, whereas Rotorua stood the test of time 180 years or something. So I'm glad there's no byline. Rotorua is, is the name that should sell even if we didn't have a logo on it, I'd still buy something that's got a lot of it on it. Um, it's got to be a good buy line that can last, otherwise it will fall over. But Tourism New Zealand got onto a very good one with the 100% pure brand. It's still around. So let that sell the rest of uh, Let that sell New Zealand. Let's have one of our own. Um, so I'm pleased with what, uh, what's, what's come up here and, uh, and say even if there is criticism, the Sydney Opera House got, uh, when it first started apparently I read about it, it got lots of criticism about it, but it's there for, for, for Sydney. So hey, thank you for, for taking us through and thank you for working with the original people who did the first Tato who called it all for us. Kappa. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Wang.
Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Andrew. Um, I mean, around the table, I totally agree with this um, symbol and this new um, branding. Um, but I'll get on to that later. My first question was just around the, um, under the relationships with Vax Vegas. Um, supporting the vaccination efforts in our community. And um, you mentioned there that um, you, uh, RED acknowledges the need to support um, the efforts in Aotearoa. And I was just wondering um, what work you're doing in that space to not, on, not only promote um, the efforts in the community to keep our community safe, but also to promote in the wider, um, I guess, also nationally to promote that we're um, to have that confidence and um, ensure that security and safety, um, that we're a safe destination too. Um, yeah, look, the, the Vex Vegas campaign was something that we just pivoted to very quickly late last year, and so you know, full credit to, um, to a number of people in my team. So Marissa Ball, uh, Hayden Mariner, Michael Hancock, who basically in Colkid, who basically dropped everything, um, and we picked it up and ran and turned around a campaign that um, did actually change some perceptions. We did see a. Uh, and certainly all the data supported that there was a very marked increase in terms of vaccination rates for Māori youth. Um, and, and, and that was our, our focus. You know, it's certainly not something which we would have turned around and said was directly in our wheelhouse um, at the start of the year. Um, but I think it was certainly done under the, uh, under the view that actually we just needed to do the right thing. Um, we donated all our staff time into that. Um, and so certainly it's a, you know, you'll see it reflected in our um, our financials, but it was a um, the money came in and the money went back out to pay for the campaign, so it was certainly neutral from that perspective. Um, in terms of everything else we do, we certainly do um, put a lot of messaging out in terms of our regular marketing around this continues to be a safe place to visit, um, and it certainly is. Um, I think we're all um, really pleased to see you know the changes around the border. Um, you know, finally starting to emerge. I would imagine that we'll start to see some changes around international visitors certainly arriving ahead of what was um, initially signalled. Um, I think common sense would say that you know, once the threat is peak and, and hospitalisation rates uh, starts to decline, we'll, we'll get some positive news on that. Um, and I'd reflect that actually last time when we had the bubble um, open with Australia, you know, the number of Australians that actually emerged pretty quickly. Um, and we did see bookings actually pick up pretty quickly in terms of out of those, um, out of those Australian states. So, look, I think there is, you know, we continue to kind of plan that, you know, uh, you know, with, heaven forbid, there's no, um, new variants, um, but actually we will be back into a place where we're, we're starting to hum, um, later in the year. It certainly won't be the same, it won't be, um, full noise, but, um, certainly, you know, we'll be getting some people and some dollars through the, uh, through the tools. Thank you. Um, my second question was, you kind of half um, <laughs> predicted my second question, was around, um, yes, this, this year and hopefully the reopening of everything. Um, but um, even when we had our summer um, period, there were, um, I know, and especially now, significant staff shortages across the hospitality and tourism sector. Um, how do you think we've placed in preparation for that opening and for that return in Aussies and um, people worldwide? Look, I think we're better uh, positioned than some places. Um, I guess there's a few different strands to this. So, in one strand, I think that we still advocate or are advocating very strongly for an extension of some of the funding that was provided to, to the five South Island regions to kickstart businesses. Um, you know, we know we've got a lot of local businesses that have just, you know, they've just depleted basically all of their reserves, um, and so the ability for them just to get that little injection just as we start to see visitors uh, return is probably critical. Um, beyond that, in terms of specifically our own workforce, look, there's a number of different factors that will play into that. Um, certainly, um, you will you will see some working visitor um, visa holders um, emerge. Um, probably quite quickly. Um, our view is that we need to continue to do what we can to, to ensure that locals are getting the skills and are getting the experiences required to get back into that sector. We're working with NSD on, on a reasonably large program at the moment that would see, which would have a particular focus on tourism and hospitality and into the, into the accommodation sector. Um, we're hopeful that 
you know, that'll look to smooth and overcome some of the challenges that, you know, that small businesses in particular have in terms of getting, uh, you know, people um, back into, into the workforce. So that's a, that's a big focus. Um, I think the other nice thing is that, um, you know, our, our tourism industry and hospitality industry traditionally locally has actually always been built on locals. You know, like you, when you go to a tourism experience here in Rotorua, you're likely to be served by someone um, who's at least a Kiwi um, and certainly has probably um, lived here uh, most of their lives. So um, I think we're in reasonable shape. I don't withstand that there are still some challenges there, but um, we're just, you know, we've got to do everything we can to, to get through the next few months. Oh, thank you, and um, yeah, it was great to see around the, um, the tech story too, the involvement in the tech and innovation with the local business that also won the um, one of the uh, Chamber Business Awards too, Salt and Tonic. Um, but just around the tohu and symbol, um, I was really proud to be able to wear a T-shirt with this branding for a uh, virtual for mill for the um, for the international market. And when I first put that T-shirt on, I was thinking, looking at the symbol, I was thinking. Does it look like the guys, or does it look like Te Ahi Tupua? And when I, I said, oh no, it looks like both, and it looks like a story of Rotorua, and it absolutely is, you know, and I think it's come at a really great time with this, re- hopefully with this reopening this year, you know, it shows the story, uh, I think it instills that pride um, into our people and our culture, and it really showcases that too, um, and so, no, really great work, and thank you so much for all that you do. Thank you, and that is a lovely way to wrap up this. Um, Thank you very much. I think there will be some interesting discussions uh, on the reaction to this brand because, like all art, it will be perceived differently to others. So um, thank you very much for your update this morning. Now, um, I think it may be best if we actually take a quick break now before we delve into our operational report. So we will return in 10 minutes at 2 past 11, please.
Welcome back everyone. I'll just get you to take your seats please. Well thank you for your patience for that break. Uh, we'll kick back off. We are on page 39 of our agenda and we have our financial performance for the seven months ended 31 um, January. Um, can I please have a mover and a seconder to receive this report? Moved by Her Worship the Mayor, seconded by Councillor Rokawa Tate. All those in favour please say aye. Carried. <laughs> Thank you. And we'll now go to Thomas Holley who has a presentation uh, for us this morning. Thank you Thomas. Uh, thank you Madam Chair and good morning uh, councillors and, and board members and those in Zoomland. Uh, my apologies, the, the report is mislabeled in your um, agenda, so it is the uh, seven month operating result for the period ended 31 January, not the six month, and there's a period there where it just talks about just for the month. Um, just with regards to just a reminder again of the, of the previous uh, six months and discussions that we had with regards to, to the pressures that, um, that we are facing um, around our finances. So obviously there's a significant amount of investment going into the uh, Infrastructure Acceleration Fund and it's hoped that very shortly we will be successful in that and if we are successful then we should get a um, significant capital investment into our um, infrastructure to, to free up housing. Uh, there's ongoing investment into the community safety space, in particular around the CCTV expansion, etc. Uh, we have faced the uh, landfill legal costs, we've provided the QE Health a uh, million dollar grant with regards to uh, getting their new build, helping them get that across the line. And on top of that, um, we're obviously facing uh, COVID challenges and the issues that that brings, uh, not only to our revenue streams, but we're also now starting to see um, quite an impact on on some of our projects um, with regards to uh, availability of, of resources and obviously the uh, inflation increases that we're seeing in our um, spend. So what are we doing about that? Well, the priority continues to stay with uh, ensuring that the work initiatives around housing and community safety um, continue. The, the team and the organisation has reforecast our operational expenditure, so we have looked at where we can uh, scrimp, save, pull back, uh, but in particular we've done so with the view of not reducing our levels of service. And so while there might be subtle, light, small changes of levels of service, there's no significant change of levels of service. And we are at the moment um, forecasting to, to save about 1.6 million over the coming six months to help offset, up, offset uh, the, the financial pressures that we are, are seeing. A good portion of that is down to vacancies, so like every other organisation, organisation in New Zealand, we, we, we face the same pressures around uh, staffing and um, it is challenging times at the moment with regards to, uh, to recruitment and retaining staff and that's, um, we're seeing that all over the world but in particular New Zealand seems to be quite, quite difficult due to our probable, or likely to our isolation over the last two years. And so our forecast that we talked about last month to be in the year within 2% of budget uh, hasn't changed and we believe that we're on, on track for that. So what has changed over the last month? Well, we have seen a, a $300,000 improvement in the underlying um, position. So our variance to budget has shrunk from uh, 2.6 million to about 2.39. And just a reminder though that um, the reports that we do give you do not include um, capital revenues, in particular NZTA subsidies and so forth. And so when we do include those into the mix, we do uh, have an overall surplus uh, and that is tracking a little bit behind budget and that's due to the timing of some of our bigger capital works programs that are uh, getting significant um, contributions from externals and those contributions obviously don't come through until um, milestones are achieved or that that work has been completed. So just a reminder that we, we do budget for a surplus overall and we are uh, providing a surplus overall. Again, just a snapshot um, showing where the pressure points are in our organisation. So there's been some small improvements uh, with regards to the variances in our, our roading and footpaths program of work. Uh, and again, the, the pressure remains in community wellbeing. Uh, 
and the district development and regulatory. So again, the two areas that are facing moving new challenges around uh, events and venues and, and parking, and the, from a cost perspective, uh, supporting housing and um, community saving, uh, safety. Our capital spend um, is progressing. Um, it is starting to fall a little bit behind though, and what we've seen um, recently is uh, we, as we go out to market, uh, there's not the volume of um, contractors that are putting prices in. Uh, so we're just watching that and trying to understand what that, that looks like. Uh, and from a contractor's perspective, there seems to be a, for them an unwillingness to price on uncertainty, particularly around uh, availability of resources and pricing of that resources. And so that will likely put a bit more pressure into our capital uh, program going forward. So the team are just um, looking at trying to understand uh, what the impact of that may be going forward. Uh, we had already forecast, uh, I think, a $40 million underspend in our capital works program, targeting a $100 million spend. Uh, but it's, it, there is a risk now with the, the pressures that New Zealand's facing, in particular around logistics with ships being turned around because they can't unload, and uh, high competition for scarce resources, that um, it's likely our projects will also be um, impacted. Uh, with regards to this, those big projects that are currently underway, like the Performing Arts Centre and the Lakefront, obviously those contractors have, um, if they have contracts in place, they have secured materials, and at this stage we're not seeing any impact on, on those. Uh, with regards to the forecast underspend, uh, just sorry, I have to click through these. Um, those are the projects that make up that forecast um, position, and there's been no real change from that that was reported on the previous month. So all those are just down to uh, timing, um, and uh, the majority of those are either underway or are scheduled to, to get underway uh, shortly. And so just a reminder, uh, the overall um, position for us hasn't um, changed. There's a slight improvement for the month. Uh, we are still um, expecting an operating result within $2 million of budget, or we're up to 2%, two um, including that, one, that million dollar grant. Our capital expenditure will be down, uh, and though that underspending capital expenditure will be reflected in less borrowings required. And just a reminder that uh, the way that we are tracking, while we are under significant pressure in both revenues and operating expenditure, uh, we do not anticipate using having to use borrowings to fund operating expenditure. Uh, with that, happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Thomas. Um, I did have one question. Uh, recently in the media there was um, a quote about uh, Rotorua Lake Council being almost $6 million in the breach, uh, largely due to COVID. So that's not at all um, what I have heard or what I can see um, in our statement. So are you able to just uh, clarify um, what that issue is and that that is actually not the case? Um, I did see the headline and I, I don't understand it myself. I'm assuming it's because of the uh, the way that we report and not include um, other revenues like our capital subsidies, and they may have misinterpreted that, um, but I, I don't understand where they got that figure from, because the, the reports and the presentations to yourself, uh, we've never talked about that. Yeah, thank you very much for confirming that. Were there any other questions? Yes, Councillor Maxwell. Just one on here. Um, Page 40, um, is where it says staff vacancies across the organisation resulted in savings of 423,000. Whilst I'm wanting to celebrate at the same time, I'm sort of pulling back and it's either to yourself or JP. It's really thanks to a lot of the rest of our staff who've helped carry the load and if we've We've had vacancies over this period, um, um, but are we sort of tracking back up to near better no. situation? So thank, thank you, Councillor. I think at, at the start yeah. of this financial year, I did I did warn elected members that uh, one of the biggest risks we faced was staff retention and attraction, 
and uh, it's no surprise that at this point that is one of our biggest challenges at the, at the moment. Um, if anything, it's probably getting a, a little bit worse. Um, Christmas is always one of those times where uh, people reflect on where they are and what they want to do, so we have seen a little bit of an uplift. Um, but I'm saying that uh, we're not unique and it's not unique to us. So we are experiencing, unfortunately, what every other business in New Zealand has and where there are highly talented individuals with good skill sets that are well sought after. It's a really competitive market and we've just got to up our game and make ourselves more attractive to, to not only retain the talent that we have but to attract new talent. Yeah, and, and at this time, when you when you carry the level of vacancies that, that we are, and we're no, by no means that bad compared to some of our neighbouring councils. I heard an eye-watering amount for Hamilton City Council. Um, it, it eventually leads to, unfortunately, that the, the, the staff that we do have here um, have to, and they do, um, pick up the, the workload, uh, which puts more pressure on them. Thank you, and thank you for that um, notice of appreciation to the staff, Councillor Maxwell. We have a question from Councillor Kai Fong. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Thomas, it's just a question around, um, I suppose it's budget creep, because we know that with contractors being increasingly under pressure from both um, wages and from um, supply constraints and everything that's just happening in terms of inflation, what strategy for dealing with the potential extension of costs in our capital projects because of these unforeseen um, increases in, in, in costs for our contractors? Yeah, and, and that's the question and the work that we're, we're currently undertaking now. We're only just starting to see the impact of that in the latest round of, of tendering in our works and we need to understand uh, what that impact is and whether it means that there's a, uh, whether we choose to do work now at a higher cost or whether we defer and hope that, um, that the current inflationary and resource constraints will, will correct themselves or do we have to adjust our programs or do we just have to spend more unfortunately uh, to get the work done. Uh, the key is I guess with regards to um, making the appropriate decision for the renewal of our exist um, sorry, a critical infrastructure, making sure that we don't put that at risk and do the work that we need to do. But there is other capital work that we can choose to do at a different time, and that's just the, the piece of work, unfortunately, that's ahead of us to understand how we approach that. Thanks, Thomas. I, I suppose the yeah, question of um, looking at what our priorities are, if we need to work out what work we need to get underway as soon as possible and how we fund that as opposed to work that may not be quite so critical and could perhaps be um, further down the, the, the order. Yep, I agree. Thank you. Thank you. Your Worship, the Mayor. Thomas, you don't really allude to it, but you do talk about the three water reform. And my question to you is are the chief financial officers being involved at all in liaison with the working party about how we manage balance sheet separation? I'm hearing on an entity meeting that I'm involved in that, you know, just add it to your debt and then that will just be carried over to the new entities and I'm saying, well, that's not how we're looking at it. So are you involved in this? Uh, there, there are a number of working party groups and uh, with regards to Entity B, there is a, a, a CFO group that has previously met and discussed these issues and, and challenges. Uh, unfortunately though, it's gone a bit quiet and we haven't met probably since October and November last year and that probably reflects where the government is with regards to that, that program of work. So uh, yes, we have raised concerns uh, around uh, how debt is assigned and in particular uh, how funding can be split. Um, there's other challenges with regards to uh, legal access to infrastructure that is transferred to one entity that sits on public land, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so again, uh, it's like uh, my colleague Stavros, uh, we are currently just waiting to see what the government does next, but there does seem to be a, a quiet period where um, we are just waiting and seeing. Yeah. Do you want to answer the aspect, because it's particularly pertinent for us, and it's probably Stavros too, about um, Rotuiti, Rotama and Tarawera about just add it to your debt? Yeah, so 
With regards to the three waters reform, we're, we're under strict instructions from the Department of Internal Affairs that we have to adhere to our LTP and assume that um, that's what we have to stick to. We, we can't um, just go outside of that and, and add significant more debt for projects um, that weren't anticipated in the hope that three waters reform uh, takes care of this. We have it's not clear with regards to the government instructions on how that debt would, would take place. So at the moment, um, we are acting prudently within the financial strategy of our long-term plan. Thank you. Thank you very much. There appears to be no other questions for the financial report. Thank you. We'll move to the operational report. We're on page 42 of our agenda now. May I please have a mover and a seconder that the operational report for January 2022 be received. Moved by Ms. Bray, seconded by Councillor Wang. All those in favour, please say aye. Yep. Um, we'll take the report uh, as read rather than getting each DC to present. Um, so if you do have any specific questions as we go through them, then we'll just direct it to um, the DCE. But uh, we'll hand back to Thomas um, and also welcome back Joe um, to the table. And do you have a presentation or just overview? Uh, no presentation, but um, Joe's just come to the table to just uh, give a bit of an overview of where we are with regards to the impacts of COVID and how we're um, dealing with it. So obviously, you know, 22,000 cases a day. And so this is a piece of work that uh, Joe is leading within our organisation around our response in BCP. So I'll just have Joe um, just, just talk to it and obviously happy if you'd ask any questions on them later. Uh, yes, uh, uh, another COVID-19 update, um, given its uh, ubiquitous and sustaining nature. Uh, so what's new um, since the last time I gave a verbal report? And of course it's Omicron um, and the onset of Omicron. So if you recall, um, last night um, we talked about um, an anticipation of Omicron. Uh, we did a review of our uh, BCP, our Business Continuity Planning, um, uh, with the objective that uh, with, uh, with uh, Omicron in the mix, uh, how do we maintain our uh, delivery of our core services? Uh, so that work was completed uh, by uh, all the, the various areas, uh, and then it was uh, stress-tested uh, at three shoals of uh, levels of high, high absenteeism, at 30% uh, absenteeism in terms of the, if we, in, in that scenario, what would happen from that point from a from, a, again, a, con a continuity perspective. So it's, um, it's good that we had uh, reflected on that and prepared for that. And, of course, uh, all the modelling has now manifested itself in terms of the exponential growth in cases. Um, so uh, we s what we see in our community is also uh, reflected uh, within, uh, within the Council. So we certainly are experiencing some cases, um, still uh, reasonably relatively low cases, but some cases of both confirmed cases of, uh, of COVID uh, and also a similar um, a number of uh, cases of household contacts. Um, so um, at, at, the, at the moment, um, uh, from a process point of view, internally within Council, I want to give you some comfort around how we are, how we are managing that. Uh, so um, the requirement of, of staff if they are in a situation where they're uh, either a confirmed case or a, a confirmed uh, household contact, um, uh, they must inform their manager and then they inform me. Uh, at that point, I then assign um, a, a contact person uh, to that to that case. Uh, so we go through uh, a bit of a process, and I guess uh, also in anticipation that the the um, all the processes and the contact tracing nationally are all reasonably overwhelmed at the moment. Uh, so, in recognition of that, we're trying to be proactive in terms of our approach around the way that we manage the, those cases and the support that we provide. So, after assigning a contact um, in each case, um, we all talk to that individual around uh, the level of symptoms that they're experiencing uh, when the infectious period uh, started. Uh, if there are potential uh, council close contacts uh, using the guidelines of the ministry, um, then we look to uh, support um, and ensure that people are getting good support uh, if they are self-isolating. Um, and we'll also talk to them around access to uh, rapid antigen testing 
in terms of facilitating that if we can. Um, uh, certainly, um, uh, there are things uh, uh, across the organisation, the, the odd unit that, um, or the individual units that uh, have already triggered the threshold of high absenteeism. Um, and so, in, um, in uh, that, those three cases at the moment, uh, we've now triggered our next step in the BCP. Uh, uh, for example, customer solutions are an example of that for us at the moment, uh, where their plan was to um, manage uh, through some working from home uh, and also utilising uh, other staff that have cross-skilled in, uh, in, in that role and being able to pull them into, uh, into that function. So um, they seem to be coping well, and again, based on some good planning uh, previously in the BCP. Um, Council also continues to uh, provide uh, support to um, uh, some of the initiatives from uh, Lakes uh, DHB, in particular around uh, distribution of uh, rapid antigen testing, uh, where uh, they've developed, a, I guess, a sort of a hub and spoke model uh, where the stadium um, staff by council um, uh, um, staff members uh, 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 managing the distribution of uh, rates to uh, various points around Rotorua, so our team are actively uh, managing that process. Also, uh, linking with NSD, um, providing uh, or recruiting a resource um, around the uh, coordination of CHI, so that's uh, been another instance that we've uh, worked our way through. Um, certainly, um, there's been a little bit of noise um, uh, around the um, the recent court case uh, with the public health order with respect to police and defence staff, uh, and of course it's very fact based, uh, and the basis for that decision is completely different from the scenario that we did our risk assessment on, and uh, and, and uh, you know, the advice of course is that uh, that decision for police and defence staff is not relevant for uh, for our, our process and the policy that we've we've implemented. Um, other than that, there's, there's been no other um, exchange I've had uh, around, uh, around that, that, that situation. That's where we, where we sit. Um, still, again, still low numbers. We're, we're managing, um, but you know, I, I expect the, that those numbers will, of course, increase, particularly as we see more and more household contacts convert to confirmed cases as, uh, as the cases is uh, national. Well, thank you very much, Joe. I just wonder if there's any questions. Are you happy to take them now? Thank you. Uh, first question from Councillor Kumar. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Joe. Joe, you mentioned uh, rapid antigen test, and but you spoke a whole lot of scenarios around procedures uh, um, you're taking. Just wanted to know, do we have rapid antigen test available immediately in case staff in the organisation feel unwell? Yeah. So, uh, thank you for that. Uh, the, um, there's two things. Um, firstly, we, we registered as a provider of critical services, so uh, we were able, uh, with the appropriate documentation, to uh, authorise access to uh, rapid antigen testing for staff deemed to be critical workers. Uh, certainly that process has worked over, over the last week or so, uh, but there's been a, a couple of changes since. Um, fortunately, um, uh, we've been uh, able to, uh, through, through the process, um, secure an inventory of, uh, of um, rapid antigen tests uh, on site. So we have a store of a, um, we have a small inventory that we hold on site um, that we've already started to deploy. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Your Worship. Jim Joe, thank you for the update. Um, I was on a Zoom last night with mayors of the country about coping with stress with this Omicron um, and it was really valuable, it was from a clinical psychologist but I was wondering what the level of stress you're, you're seeing in the staff? Um, certainly the, the um, um, first thing, uh, stuff are here um, uh, of course the stress is, is you know, around um, caution or being careful. Like, you know, I, I get daily emails around how we manage certain things and, and trying to give them, um, again, a degree of comfort around our, our processes. It still doesn't 
always negate a, a sense of concern. Uh, so, you know, that, we certainly see that. Uh, um, a couple of these I saw myself as a contact person. So when I when I speak to our staff, they're either a confirmed case or a um, um, or a household contact. Um, there are, there are there's a range of there are those you can tell that they're, they're well prepared and well organised. Uh, others, um, it's just m m more from the point of view of um, um, uh, other members of whānau uh, that, uh, that are, you know, have symptoms and that. So I, I, I certainly express, um, see the stress more around their immediate um, uh, household members, ensuring that they're getting um, access to, to testing. Uh, that are getting access uh, to um, support that they'll require around self-isolating. Self um, so we're, again, wherever we can, particularly around uh, support, um, if it's around um, food, which is important, uh, um, occasionally we've been able to link them through to NSD in terms of uh, their national programme around support. That seems to be working quite well uh, from, from the feedback that I've seen, but this issue is absolutely um, uh, we certainly promote our, our EAP program, uh, as, as you would expect. Um, but I think um, staff certainly um, uh, do appreciate uh, council being proactive in terms of contact and, and, and checking in uh, and making sure that uh, if they have any concerns that they can still come back to us in terms of any other support that they might need. Sorry, Joe. What's EOP? EOP. E so that's sorry. Yes, thank you. Oh, EAP. Uh, EAP. Yeah, yeah. The Employee Assistance Program. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. Well, there appears to be no further questions on that. But look, thank you very much, Joe. Um, it's been quite a challenging time, but you've been certainly doing that um, with a lot of empathy for our staff and, of course, their wider families. Um, and also, very important. Uh, the business continuity uh, planning that has gone into place um, to ensure that as a critical service. Uh, we're able to continue to operate and serve our community with those essential services. Um, so thank you for your work behind the scenes, Joe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. So we'll move to page 43 now um, to our district leadership and democracy group with our DCE Una, and also like to invite Kehi, Kehi Tafai, to provide an update on the Electoral Model Bill 2022 and speak to a presentation. Obviously, a lot of work gone behind this, so exciting to get an update from them today. Kia ora, thank you, Tanya. Um, you've taken away my introduction, so that's all good. Um, so I'm, at this point, I'll just hand over to Kihi. Um, I, just, I guess what I want to say is we have reached um, quite a significant milestone in our path, I guess, towards uh, this piece of work. Kihi has been um, taking the, the lion's share of the workload and getting it to this point, so it's only fitting that he then uh, provides that update to you. So I'll hand over to Kihi, all yours. Kia ora tātou. Tua tahi, tautoku nga mihi kwa mihi a e matua chuev ki tō tātou ramatira anaru. Nau mai whakatau mai ra, ki wainui a mātou te whānau o te kaunihera o ngā roto o roturua. Nau mai whakatau mai. Ki wainui a mātou o tira, ki wainui tēnei rōpū, tēnei ohu, tēnei kumitsi mahi me te aro tūruki. O reira tūrua, ki nga mema o te kumitsi nei, me mihi kā sikua ki a koutou. Tua tōru, ki te huna, ko hono mai a tinana nei, a ipurangi nei, ki tēnei hui o tātou, a tēnei no tātou katoa. Ko wai a hau, ko kihi taha whai tōki inoa. He kai mahi a hau, mo te kā hui whai tua tūtahi, ko te District Leadership and Democracy tērā. Nō reira, a kia ora no tātou. Thank you, Madam Chair, for allowing me the privilege to be able to speak and present uh, about the process of introduction of a local bill and in this case it is the Rotorua District Council Representation Arrangements Bill. Okay. Uh, and before uh, I go into the presentation, uh, just to give you an idea about 
what I'm going to speak to. I'm just going to provide uh, a review or a snapshot of the journey that we've taken uh, to get to the point that we're at today. Uh, I'm going to speak to the actions and what's actually currently happening at the moment and then what's the process to follow uh, after that. So I think if we look at our sort of presentation at the moment, I must take a step back and acknowledge uh, Te Tatau o Te Arua in terms of their consultation uh, with uh, Te Arua Whanui, in terms of collating their whakaaro and their feedback in terms of uh, tēnei mel, uh, te wāori Māori. Uh, so, mihi ka tiko e koutou, uh, te tatou o te aroa, e hara tērā mahi te mahi māma, e nari i tutuki, no reira, um, mihi ka tiko e koutou. Uh, and, for, as a result of that process, uh, they came back to council uh, with a recommendation to inform uh, a decision in terms of uh, a Māori ward. And in May of 2021, Council resolved to establish a Māori ward, which in effect activated another process, which is the representation review, uh, because it was a change to the makeup of Council for the 2022 elections. Okay? Now, as part of the process for the representation review, there were a series of workshops that were conducted with the elected members with our community boards and with Te Tato in terms of an, a representation proposal model that will go out for consultation. Okay, um, and in May, Council adopted a draft representation proposal for public consultation. Oh, in August, sorry. Now, for the month of September, that's when the consultation was conducted. Okay, and it closed in October. Okay. Now, as part of that process, there were a number of submit, submitters and submissions that wanted to actually present in person and wanted to be heard. So there were hearings that were conducted. Uh, and as a result of those hearings uh, and the information that was collated, uh, in November, Council approved an electoral model. And as we remember, uh, that was a very interesting meeting at the time, uh, a very contentious issue. Uh, it was a robust meeting. Um, however, an outcome of that of that hui was the fact that okay, we have to approve a model, but actually council had a preferred model, and so as part of the uh, approval process, instructed the CE to pursue the process of a local bill, okay? So, after that, uh, Council established a project team and commenced the drafting process, okay? And we were fortunate enough, because of the time frames that we were under, that we set on an initial draft and submitted to the Parliamentary Council office in December, <laughs> the closing day of the office, uh, in 2021. Now, <laughs> we were under, with the understanding that we realised <laughs> that we were closing up to, but it was the fact that we wanted to get it in there. So when they reopened uh, this year, that it would already be on their radar. Um, <laughs> one thing to note, so as of this month, February 23rd, we have finally approved a finalised draft. So we submitted our initial draft in December and it's taken too long to get the 10th iteration of the draft. Okay? So this was approved to go out for public notification. Okay? And so public notification actually commenced yesterday. Okay? Wednesday the 2nd of March. For the period of 15 working days until March the 23rd. Okay, which leads us to okay, where we are today. Now, as part of the requirements under the standing orders of the House of Representatives, uh, in terms of notification to the public, 
it has to be, I'm sorry, hard copies of the draft have to be available for public viewing for a period of 15 working days. Okay? So that's why our public publication, our public notification period is for 15 working days. Uh, and these are the channels that we are currently sort of utilising at the moment to get the awareness out there and to inform our public. Uh, utilising our Kōrero Mai and Let's Talk platform. Um, and the Lakes, Arukura Lakes Council website, our public notices section. Now there is a requirement under the standing waters that um, the promoter of the bill uh, has to utilise a website under their control. Okay? And so hence why we're using our channels. Uh, also one of the requirements too of the standing orders is that it has to be published in a newspaper uh, that is circulated within the district uh, once for a period of two consecutive weeks. Okay, So we are using the Rotorua Daily Post, so it went out of public notice yesterday. It's going to be in the Rotorua Daily Post next week, the 9th of March, Wednesday, and also the Rotorua Weekender, so this weekend. Uh, on and next Saturday. And the reason being is that you've got two avenues, one's paid and one's unpaid. Okay? So we want to ensure that uh, the majority of our population are informed and have access to it and so they know about it. Uh, we're also uh, notifying those that engage in our representation review process so those that submit it, uh, those that uh, attend hearings, as persons of direct interest, because they actually participate engaged in the process. Uh, we're using our media platforms like Dauro FM, uh, our media release that went out yesterday as well, uh, ePanui, social media. Uh, these are outside of the requirements, but we don't want to just do the minimum. We want to ensure that we're doing more than we should. Okay? Um, our, and as I said previously, our hard copies have to be made freely available for our public, and they are in our customer centre here at Civic Centre, as well as Takamodi. And it's on both floors of Takamodi too, on the ground floor and the first floor. Um, and also, as per the recommendations of the Parliamentary uh, Council Office, um, they have given us a list of uh, persons that we should give notice to, and um, elected members, you would have received uh, some information last night, uh, and so that was the template of the information that was sent. Okay, obviously tailored to the audience. Okay? It wasn't just a generic one that was sent out. Okay? Uh, and so we've been really fortunate that uh, we've had a template to follow, uh, as in we've been supported by Canterbury Regional Council. Uh, they've uh, freely given us their uh, public notification package as to a process for us to follow because um, for some of us, and I think the majority of us, this is a new process. Okay, um, So they have been supporting us in this. And for those that might not be aware, uh, Canberra Regional Council are actually going through uh, the process of in introducing a local bill at the moment for the Canterbury Regional Council Maitaku Representation Bill. And it's currently at the select committee process. Okay, So it was a good guide for us in terms of, okay, uh, what's to come. So, in terms of what's, what's coming up next, what are our upcoming actions, once uh, the public notification period has been completed, we collate all the information and our promoter, which is our uh, chief executive, uh, that will uh, declare to the office of the clerk in Wellington our intentions to introduce the local bill. Okay? And so that's, if everything goes well, that's March 28th. Okay? 
um, which gives us an opportunity because on March 29th uh, there's a sitting of the House. And so um, that's an opportunity to be introduced, our local bill to be introduced to the House, uh, which, because for those that might not be aware, you declare your local bill, then you introduce it at the first sitting of the House for that week, and then on the third sitting day is the first reading of the bill. Okay? However, there is a process in terms of if it's declared urgent, if, it, if there is an urgency declared to it, then it can be read on the same day that it was introduced. However, uh, we're just going by the sort of normal, regular process, and so March 31st will be the first reading, potentially, of the bill. And upon uh, after the, the reading, then it's referred to the select committee. Once we make the dec- once sorry once our promoter makes the declaration to the office of the clerk, the process then moves out of our control. It is now out of our hands, so we have no say in terms of time frames and timings. So the process that we are currently conducting, we have, uh, but just for your information, your consideration. Okay. So. Thank you very much, Kahi, your wishes. Thank you, Kahi, for that. that. Three months is pretty spectacular, actually, for drafting a local bill. Um, we had an Easter trading bill that actually took about eight years to get through the house um, and crossed elections and meandered all over the show. So three months to actually getting it uh, to PCO in 10 iterations is quite amazing as well. So the detailed work's obviously been done to present something that um, is as good as it can be. Uh, the issue for us is the time frame that we have to... This is urgent now. I like We said we'd do this. Um, the time frame to actually be able to get this through um, building up to the pre-election period isn't long. Um, So is there anything else we can do to expedite this? I know um, I'd love to hear from Te Tata or Te Arawa as well. We've we've been very fortunate in terms of, so uh, MP Tamati Coffee is going to be sponsoring the bill. So he's been actively promoting our bill and the awareness of the bill uh, throughout the party and other ministers in Parliament to garner support in terms of um, trying to get this across the line, as well as our, our mayor has done the same thing as well. And we're really fortunate that we have uh, advocates uh, like those uh, available. Uh, and, and I suppose it's, it's one of those things in terms of uh, because if, if you might not be aware, Royal Assent, which is the Governor General signing off and it becomes an act, uh, we have to, we were aiming to get the bill or get a stamp before 1st of June. Yeah. To ensure that there's a sufficient amount of time before the uh, 2022 elections. Okay? So as uh, Her Worship said it's a very short time frame. So uh, we've, we, we have, we've been under the pump this, this whole time, but it's been a really uh, exciting journey, actually. Uh, so, yeah, we'd really sort of hope that there'd be further sort of support to try and push this across the line, because it is the council's preferred option. Okay? Mm-hmm. Council don't even though they approved their an electoral model, that wasn't the preferred. Okay, so this we're trying to effectively utilise what we're doing at the moment to try and bring that into effect. Well done. Thank you, Councillor Maxwell, followed by Councillor Rokawate. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Una and Kihi, for the um, 
for following up on our um, on our preferred model from you gave all the timelines and that there and um, it was very interesting going back over that period but uh, I think you've all done a tremendous job in um, putting for that over the Christmas New Year summer period and to think that we we might get some resolution by around March 28th or 31st. Um, so for me, um, uh, the question that I was looking at was, you touched on something, Canterbury, what regional council, did they do something with NITA? Uh, have they got a case ending or they've done something? Thank you. Uh, Dave. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, the Canterbury Regional Council uh, currently have a local bill uh, that they're looking to uh, bring into effect, which is the Canterbury Regional Council uh, Naitahu Representation Bill. Basically, in a nutshell, it's a bill that allows uh, Naitahu to appoint two members to council. That's effectively what they're trying to do, okay? Uh, and so it's currently at the select committee process. Supplementary, um, you said that on March the 28th, I didn't get right it down, but so March the 28th, what are you collating together that we haven't already got there? Uh, I didn't sort of get that part. Okay, it's fine. Uh, so, as part of the declaration, you have ah. to collate all the information in terms of evidence of your public notices in the paper, evidences of the communication that you have sent out to your persons of direct interest, uh, all the parties that you've uh, engaged with and informed. Uh, so that's all part of the pack that makes up the declaration to the Office of the Clerk. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor O'Kawate. Thank you. It's good to hear the timeline and, and um, where we go from here, so that's really good. Look, to be honest, I have no doubt that we will make it through in, within the time. Uh, the government insisted last year that all LTAs have Māori representation, so they will want to support anyone that comes along and says, we need, we need your assistance to get this through because it's what the community wants and it's certainly what here we want, so I don't doubt that. I would like to see, though, that we don't only rely on... Um, Tamati to speak in the House, we should also be um, alerting Todd and also Rawari, um, particularly Rawari being, being the, um, you know, the co-leader of the Māori Party and supportive of Māori representation, so I presume that's happening. Thank you. Uh, yes, Councillor, oh, we've seen a uh, notice and already had conversations with uh, Rawari regarding the bill and he's in full support. Thank you. I'd like to think that all the MPs of Rotorua were supporting this bill. There's been uh, quite a lot of effort gone into it. Um, Councillor Donaldson, followed by Councillor Yates. Thank you, Madam Chair. Through you, um, not sure who's going to answer this one, but great presentation, Kihi. Um, so, all going well, Royal Assent uh, by 1 June, which gives candidates maybe five weeks to decide where they might position themselves in relation to the, re the electoral model or the representation model we have. If uh, there's a spanner in the works, we then fall back to the 118, which I understand is still subject to local government commission uh, review and, and, um, and appeals. Um, so where's the mahi on... Is that proceeding in tandem so that... Um, you know, there'll be a, a determination on that or, uh, in time for candidates to make their minds up. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Donaldson. Yes, you are right. In fact, there are two processes going on simultaneously, um, but completely different um, at the same time here. Uh, so we're, in terms of the representation review, I guess proper, for want of a better word, 
um, all of the appeals and objections that um, were lodged with council are now in the hands of the Local Government Commission. They uh, go through all of that information and including um, an assessment and review of uh, council's decision making in adopting that preferred model, that 118 model. Part of their process is that they can conduct hearings where they come back um, and the appealants have the opportunity to speak to their appeal or objection and council as well has an opportunity to represent itself um, and support um, adoption of its model. At this point in time, the Local Government Commission have not confirmed with us whether uh, hearings will be run, but it would be fair to say um, to expect that we will be having a hearings because this is a process that needs to run its course as well. The Local Government Commission um, needs to make a final determination by the 7th of April, so that would be in place. Then if we are successful with the local bill, that would overturn the uh, determination of the Local Government Commission. I think that answers. Thank you. Councillor Yates followed by Mr Waru. Tēnā koe in through you, Madam uh, Chair. Uh, nei rā te mihi kawatu, kia koutou koutou ohu una kihi. Uh, I have the fortune of actually catching up with Kihi at the moment to help along with this campaign on our Te Aru FM show. But um, one of the things I was made aware of this morning is, yes, Todd does know about this. I interviewed him, but what he um, seemed to be of the opinion was that this would not get through this year. So may I please encourage each and every one of us sitting around here, we were unanimous last year when we voted on this, not one of our councillors voted this down, so we need to be talking to our whānau, we need to be talking to our MPs, and Todd is our MP of Rotorua, and to have him actually feel a little hesitant that we wouldn't get this through was quite a bit of a shock actually. So how confident are you that we will have the possibility of having this before us in June 2022, Una? Okay. <laughs> Look, I think we have run a very um, rigorous process to date. Um, we have pulled out all of the stops to this point um, to get to notification. Uh, there's been some challenges, um, and as Kitty has pointed out, uh, we've been through 10 iterations of the draft local bill in itself. Um, the, the next stage is then, uh, it is out of our hands once it gets introduced to, um, to the House. So it's imperative that um, we have members, um, our sponsors, who are really um, supporting us and really are promoting this strongly when it gets into that select um, committee stage. Um, we know it is tight um, and we have a plan that once we have decisions um, we are able to launch directly into an education and awareness program so that uh, candidates and voters will be um, fully informed as to how they will vote or even how they may choose to stand in the next elections. Thank you. Mr Waru. Um, it was around the, you know, what's, what, what's it actually looking like? Hearing a lot of quarter about it, but, um, you know, is it, does it really have a good chance of getting through? I certainly hope so, and I'm quite familiar to, I think, Uncle Chief brought up the model that Ngaitahu has been pushing for. But I think this one is, is the way to go, um, and I just want to reiterate this model was supported by uh, um, even though we did sing to the, the one that we currently have now, Fate to Fight, um, our, our goal was always to, in the best, to support the best interests of, of Te Arawa. And uh, Kihi, Koroko uh, Una, Fate to Miha Tsura Kia Korua, I te pai o ngā mahi. I ki rā koe, hara tēnei mahi, te mahi mā mā e nā i tikata. So, uh, kia kaha tonu, and I really um, uh, want to follow up on what Councillor Yates said, well, yes, yes, no. we all have connections, we all have some push in places, let's push it in and um, give it 100%. Kia ora rātata. 
Kia ora Rawiri. Uh, Councillor McDaw, you had another comment? Thank you, um, Madam Chair, for allowing me to speak again. But um, um, when, when it was talked about getting the support for our local bill from our, our own people at Council of Rokawa raised the Rawiri Waititi and Todd and them, I can say the other night, the other day, I followed Parliament um, on, on television and it was very interesting, it was the Ngāti Rangi Tehi Bill. And it was an excellent, uh, I was just glued to the TV for it a couple of hours. And everyone spoke, and it was the third reading. And ev it was unanimous, some pretty rare. And, uh, and the praise, and this was led by Tamati Kofi, who chaired the Māori Affairs Select Committee. So, you know, I'm... Hopeful, I'm not sitting here counting my chickens before they hatch, but uh, I'm hoping I could go down there and do a haka in Parliament on the third reading. Kia ora. Kia ora. Thank you, Councillor Maxwell. Um, we'll wrap up the discussion for this there, but um, we wish you all the best as we continue on this uh, monumental journey to make sure that at the end of the day um, our community is represented in the best way that they want to be. Um, so thank you very much and thank you Kahi for uh, the relentless work that you've done behind the scenes to get us here. So kia kaha. Um, were there any other points? I don't think there were in your report, was there? No, we'll move on. So um, we now move to our Charua Partnership uh, Group on page 44. Uh, we'll take the report um, as read. We do have Gina... Uh, on, oh yeah, she's here now. We do have Gina online. Kia ora, Gina. Um, and maybe we'll just hand to you if there's anything that you want to uh, highlight in your report. Thank you. Uh, no, I, I won't highlight anything this month, but if there are any questions. Cool. So are there any questions uh, for the Chadwell Partnership Group report? We are on page 44 to 46. Yes, Your Worship. Gina, it was just that question that uh, at the housing presentation that um, came before JP, you know, the presentation of the committee, we Tatato tabled their cultural uh, climate change. No, it wasn't. What, yeah, um, housing compass. The housing compass. Um, are we going to have an opportunity to actually get into that a little bit deeper? Uh, at the governance level, we are looking to um, have a presentation from Te Pato on the wellbeing compass at an SBNS meeting. Uh, maybe in the next week, I'm not sure if anything can confirm the agenda of that. Uh, at an operational level, uh, we have had um, presentations about planning start, and we are at, at front and centre in terms of all of the work that we're doing at the moment, and thinking about how to integrate and um, do the plan changes that will be coming this year, how we can reflect um, the values in that well being compass into our planning uh, process is going forward. Thank you. Thank you. There don't appear to be any other questions. It was a very okay. concise report. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Gina, for joining us. We move now to our district development group um, and JP now joins us and welcome back uh, to our Chief Executive too, Jeff. Thank you for <laughs> handling quite a lot of uh, things at once. Um, so over to JP and we are on page 46. Morning everyone and um, Madam Chair, just I'll be joined by Mr Ward here from the Planning and Integrated Development Department as well. So. Um, Councillors and, and electorate representatives, we've tended to include within our reports information that um, gives you a snapshot of what's happening in each of the periods. So you might have seen information saying building consents are up 30% on last year or, or equivalent period. One of the things that Jason and I have talked about is just starting to introduce some graphs so you can start seeing the cumulative picture coming through uh, and get an understanding of how we're tracking against the previous year. So we thought um, we didn't get them into this year, uh, this um, month's report, but we thought we'd just give you a snapshot over the last 12 months. So I've just got a couple of slides here for Jason and I to um, go through. So um, 
And the issue we've got is we just straddled the, the two financial years. So um, what we just wanted to, to highlight to you is the, is the positive trends we're starting to see, and we've reported this to you previously. Uh, but just you can see there on that graph, um, looking back over the previous year, which is the uh, previous year's 12 months, which is the orange line at the bottom, uh, and then just looking back into the last financial year, of course, we're, we're crossing a, a financial year there. So the dotted line picks up on the end of June. So you can see there that um, compared with the previous year's performance, we ended uh, the 2021 year with 24% uh, more uh, consents for new residential lots for that previous year. Now that positive trend is obviously carried into the first seven months of this year uh, and we're currently tracking at 80% higher than that previous year's figure as well. So um, there, there's not something that horribly happens there in the centre where we go from June to July where it appears to drop to zero. Um, actually that's us crossing into the next financial year and starting off the cumulative numbers again. So um, that's just the picture of some of that positive responses there. So for us, this is the key metric to um, see that supply of lots and um, consented areas for homes. So the, the nice thing there is that we also then have a, a clear graph here, which is the issuing of building consents. So again, you can see that we compared with the previous year, um, as we finished the, the last financial year, we're up 65%. Uh, and this year we're tracking for this first seven months at 47% higher. So um, some quite positive um, growth and development there. Uh, probably the other issue that um, I would highlight, and it follows on from Thomas and Joe's presentation, is from a business continuity perspective, uh, Jason's building team is incredibly important uh, to the ability to see homes continue to be built uh, while we worry about um, COVID implications. So um, those are the team members who have to go out on site and, and inspect at various stages of a house's construction. So critical, critical um, steps within that process for a, for a, for a building. Uh, and so really important for us. So Jason, certainly within his business continuity plan, is thinking very carefully about how we manage um, the building inspectors through that process. Uh, the one other difference, and it just relates to this slide, and I'll just throw it across to, to Jason, is just the explanation about where uh, the work of Kaima Order fits within the lots created and here within the building space. Great, thanks JP. Yeah, so in terms of Kainga Ora's uh, mahi within Rotorua, it's included within the numbers for land use consent and subdivision, <clears throat> so within those numbers. However, we're working with, they have their own building consent authority, so we're working closely with them to actually obtain um, numbers in a timely timely manner to include those. So at the moment, the Kainga Ora builds are not included within those building consent numbers but they are in the subdivision and, and land use because that's, that's still within our function, so we are issuing land use and subdivision for Kainga Ora. So, um, thank you, Madam Chair. If there's any other questions anyone has for us, I'm happy to answer those. Thank you. Your Worship, please. Question, um, because there's a lot of curiosity following the workshops. It's not about the subdivisions and the consents, but about the priority area of the central business district. Um, when are we likely to see that collaborative work that's been um, undertaken? Uh, I'm, my recollection is we're, we're expecting to bring that back within the next month or so, Your Worship. So um, that there's been a couple of workshops with key stakeholders around that priority development area for the central part of the city. Uh, they've, they've almost concluded that work and we'll be expecting to bring that back. Uh, once we have that as a draft, we've got something to engage with our community more widely on. And would we have, uh, alongside of that, for those that are more used to sort of visual depictions, would we be able to see a sort of virtual 3D um, walkthrough, just so we see what it looks like with the plan change and intensification? You gave quite a long bow of, of what was required there. I don't know if it might be a fly-through. Um, we're trying to get some static images just to show the kind of the yeah, kind of visualisations like? of, of what higher density and, and um, new development along some of those key corridors might look like. So yes, we are working on that space too. Thank you. 
Yeah, thank you. While, while keeping flexible enough for it to <laughs> look like whoever's building it wants it to look like, I suppose. So it would be nice to see them. Um, Councillor Maxwell. Thank you. I was going to suggest you get that, um, that what do you call it, the flying little thing. Yeah, and let me head down at the lakefront. That was the, I, I think that's the idea. I was going to suggest earlier but about us going on another bus tour, but I think too many people are coughing at the moment, so we better stay indoors. <coughs> the question I was going to ask for you or um, uh, Jason is um, how we still for the supplies out of Auckland being the main centre for how are we down our way for? For homes. You're, t you're talking building supplies? Yeah, yeah, it's certainly a very good question. It's certainly definitely having an impact, as, as we're hearing anecdotal, and <clears throat> having to be nimble with uh, building inspections at times where having building inspections that have to be postponed, pushed back um, on that, of, you know, we'll all hear about Jib, um, but it's, it's affecting right through. Right through, we've heard some evidence where people try to start houses, haven't got enough material, so they say, okay, well, we'll put the fences up. They can't get in fencing, paling, uh, to put the fences up, so it is affecting right through um, all, all stages of house building. Thank you. There appears to be no other questions. Thank you very much, and thank you for uh, presenting that graph. It's um, quite telling visually as well. It is now my great pleasure to welcome to the table for the first time um, our new GCE for Community Wellbeing. <laughs> I think we all want to clap it there. <laughs> welcome. Um, it's very lovely to have you. Um, we have had a media release. The public is aware of the great skills that you will bring uh, to this role. Obviously not a new face in this community, um, but we are very pleased to have you on board our team. Welcome, Anaru. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, Your Worship, Mayor, um, Councillors, um, colleagues, um, uh, greetings. Ana mai ma fakahi o te moti kiro kaitau ngā pūmana we varu o te arawa te nā tātou. He mi te neke ape e e tirangatire e Trev mo te mi whakatau ki a hau i te i tirangi nei nei rātou kune mi ki a koe. O te rā ki a tātou. Uh, ko wai au, uh, ko anadu pe whairangi tōku ingoa, ure au no Ngāti Prau, no Ngāti Rangi Taurere, no Ngāti Tūwhare Tōhoki. It's, um, it's my pleasure to be here um, on day nine. Um, it was interesting because my, my wife Shelley um, and our two boys, we moved to Rotorua um, some nine years ago. Uh, we expected to stay from Wellington for about two years. Uh, my wife and children and I have <coughs> moved to Rotorua. We think it's the jewel in the crown. And whilst I've worked elsewhere in Wellington, um, we love Rotorua, and it's a great place for our children, um, for us to raise our children. And so it is you know, my pleasure and absolute honour to be home, uh, to be working uh, with the council. I really look forward to um, working with uh, our council and critical friends and our colleagues here to uh, make Rotorua a great place that we all know as we work, live and play here. I guess for me also, um, you know, I'm really fortunate to have such a talented team around me and also to work with colleagues that care deeply for Rotorua. So, um, see, I'm really I'm just proud to be home. Um, I've loved my nine days um, and I'm really looking forward to working with each of you as, as we provide the services, the safe places, um, the locations around Rotorua that people of Rotorua deserve and expect from us. So we do have a presentation today uh, that might, we hope, will address the matter raised by uh, Councillor Heatley. I was wondering if I might please um, invite up Rob to talk to Lakeweed <coughs> and then we'll take any other questions as we go. Thank you. Uh, kia ora tato. Um, thank you, Anna. Uh, obviously, we've had a, a, a fairly significant uh, event in terms of what's happened in some of our open spaces and one of our key 
uh, development areas. What I'd like to do uh, is just just sort of take you through a bit of context around um, this, this situation that we've had down at the lakefront. I've probably had, previous to this job, 20 years of sort of lake ecology understanding. Um, so I've got a pretty good idea of, of what's going on and we'll just quickly run through this and then uh, be able to open up it for a, particular questions around that perhaps what's happened and, and how we manage this. So historically weed strandings on Lake Grotorua are not unusual. Um, if you can, some of you might remember back to the 70s, 80s and 90s, um, I certainly do. Uh, you know, and we had significant weed growth in Lake Rotorua. Macrophytes is the name of this, these types of weeds. Um, and they used to blow ashore and, and there were a variety of ways of working on them in, in certain areas. You'll see an image of the lakefront there in the top left from 1995. Um, that was an event we had. Uh, and then the lower right image is actually on the eastern side of the lake in 1993. Um, that was probably, well that was definitely under a different regional plan where disturbing the lake bed with a digger was certainly not as um, considered impactful as it is now um, and so there were methods to control uh, strandings back then that were uh, that are not available now. Um, so you know we all, we all sort of remember these. Now as the lake water quality deteriorated into the 2000s and into the 2010s, we didn't get weed stranding, we got algal blooms. Okay, so there's a, there's a cycle of nutrient um, enrichment that's happened in the lake and the weed stranding sort of disappeared, we didn't have them. Uh, interestingly, this event we've had, people have said, oh, we haven't seen anything like this for 25 years. Um, which is not surprising when you sort of understand what's going on. So we went into an algal bloom situation and now we have put a lot of effort uh, ourselves, you know, Te Aroa Lakes Trust, um, the Regional Council, into cleaning up the lakes. And so we've gone out of the algal bloom phase and we're back into a, a bit of a macrophyte phase. So the last summer, this is a, this is a graph here of water temperature on Lake Rotuiti and the last image or the last side of the graph, the right hand side of the graph, uh, pretty much shows you that the lakes were about two degrees warmer this summer than they have been for the previous summers. I don't know if you mow your lawns, um, but if it's warm and it's wet, you need a bit of rainfall for your lawn, but we certainly don't need so much in the lake. Um, and there's good light, you'll get strong growth. So we've had a situation where Lake Rotorua has had a lot of weed growing in it. And then what happens in uh, the first week of February, we get, we were into tropical cyclone seasons um, and ex-subtropical cyclone Dovey hit New Zealand um, on February the 12th and the 13th, recording 80 kilometre an hour wind speeds across Rotorua from the north um, and unfortunately the lakefront development is on the southern side of the lake, the downwind side. Um, so we've had a summer of very impressive wheat growth and we've had a significant weather event that has hit the country. You know, power outages throughout Northland, floods in Taranaki and, and all sorts of things. So I think that's quite important to, to, to take, be aware that this was a, was a reason, was a nationally significant weather event that hit Rotorua. Um, this is Lake Rotorua at the lakefront on the morning of the 13th of February. So the storm sort of arrived on the evening, uh, later on the night of the 12th. Um, and pretty much blew through all day on the 13th. And we can already see what's happened is that the, the weed's growing very close to the surface. We have a we have 80 kilometre an hour winds. It starts breaking the weed off and it blows it all downwind. Okay, so this is the stranding that we've had, similar to the strandings that we had um, 25, 30 plus years ago when we had a lot of weed in the lake. So it's independent of the fact that the boardwalk is there, um, it, it was going to happen. Uh, if we had um, a south easterly, um, it might have gone the other way, but it didn't, it's come this way. So what has happened is since that incursion we've been, uh, well that stranding, sorry, we've been working with the Bay of Plenty Regional Council on removing 
as much weed as, as we can physically get to. Whaiapuni Regional Council has a, a weed harvester, so it's this vessel that, that you see here. Um, that is, it's been um, actually manufactured with the key purpose of removing weed from lakes because weeds have high levels of nutrient and it's a way to, to mechanically remove nutrients from the lake. Lake Rotorua and the Lake Rotorua Action Plan has a, a target of removing 50 tonnes of nitrogen a year through mechanical processes. So if the Regional Council can get the opportunity to get weed when it's thick, they can actually remove a lot of nitrogen. Um, the harvesting in Lake Rotorua generally doesn't work as well as Lake Rotorua or Okiri, uh, sorry, um, Okawa Bay because the weed beds aren't particularly fit, but when they wash up like this, they can get at them. So the Regional Council have, a, have an interest in, in getting this out, and they've been doing a great job down the lakefront where they can. Uh, so they've been using this machine for uh, two weeks, um, it was still operating yesterday, uh, and it's taken out nearly a 1,000 cubic metres of weed. Uh, and we have been helping that with cartage, so we've been working with that machine as well. So it's been coming into the boardwalk area, getting as close as it can and removing weed. The summer lake levels are reasonably low, so the machine can't get right into the edge of the boardwalk because it's too shallow. We had a weed incursion in uh, the winter of 2000 where the machine was able to get right up hard to the wall that was being built around the boardwalk. So it can get in close when the water's up, but the water's been low in the summer and in fact they've even commented that it's dropped in the two weeks since they've been working on it. The other area of course is inside the embayment as well where um, due to resource consent conditions uh, we can't go and drop a digger in the lake um, and actually dropping a digger in the lake is, it does have some significant hazards as I don't know if you remember the images of Bill Rigby's digger um, with just the bucket sticking up out of the water. Um, there are some soft spots out in the lake and there are some problems with putting figures in the lake. Um, so there's a variety of techniques that can be used in those areas, even from manual clearing um, and letting the wind blow it back offshore to um, root rakes and, and specialised weed buckets and things like that. So those are things that we can use. The boardwalk is being designed to support a six tonne digger, um, so a rubber track digger, so you know it's being designed with this in mind. Um, and there's some work going on at the moment about how we can actually do some work from the boardwalk if we can't get everything with the weed cutter boat or the, the weed harvester. That was an image taken this morning. Um, a lot of the weed has gone. A lot of it has been removed. Um, there's quite a bit that's blown back offshore uh, and there's stuff that's sunk. So uh, uh, the vast majority of what you saw from a couple of weeks ago has actually gone, either been removed or is, um, is naturally dissipated. In terms of moving forward from here, you know, we, we recognise that yes, we have to sort this um, out because as the lake water quality improves, we are probably going to get more weed growth. Um, climate change and, and significant events and things like that. Uh, the, whole, the whole area was designed to be able to manage this and we're working through a, a continuous improvement program to try and make sure we can get onto it reasonably quickly. If the lake levels have been a bit higher this time around, we've probably got up most of it with the weed harvester boat. So we need to make sure we've got a good approach coordinated approach with the Regional Council and Terrawa Lakes Trust on how we can do this. We've actually got uh, meetings organised for that. There are options for in-lake controls of weed because the Regional Council and Land Information New Zealand or LINS who own the water column, um, they do some weed control in the lake with herbicides uh, and so we may need to look at those particular options and areas where that could be done better. Although in saying this, this particular event of its scale probably blew weed from Macquarie Island to, um, you know, Aloha Stream out. You know, it's probably come from the whole lake to this sort of area. And then we need to uh, refine our removal techniques in terms of weed rakes and, and actually having 
access on the boardwalk for the machinery with the right sort of equipment. That, um, we have got the right machinery. Uh, we just need to make sure we're using it without any, um, you know, in a, in a careful way on the Tonga, the, the wood. And the other thing, of course, is to look at what other consenting options there are, or consentable options there are, which uh, we're working with the Regional Council on. So, um, yes, we've had a significant event down there. Yes, it has been uh, unpleasant on some days where certainly the wind's been blowing from the north again. Uh, it, my view is that this is a, you know, it's a natural event, it's a, it's a significant one. Uh, and we have to be able to manage for them and we're working on how we can make those improvements to our systems to work through that. So um, have to take any questions on that or anything else um, that might come up. Just, Anna just asked about how many tonnes. It's, it's been um, about 1,000 cubic metres, which I think... Uh, sorry, um, yeah, 1,000 cubic metres, which relates to about 500 tonne. Yeah, that's um, yeah, 90 truckloads or something like that. 90 truckloads, that's a lot. Thank yeah. you. Councillor Yates. Sina koru o te rā through you, Madam Chair. Nei i rā te mihi kia koe anaru, no mai, hara mai ki tēne o tō whare. He oe anō, kia koe, Rob. Um, ko taku pātai, it is around whether or not uh, Te Arawa Lakes Trusts have been investing a lot in Ufi and whether or not that might be a consideration at all. I don't know where that's sitting with regards to our Lake Rotorua and in particular that Lake Frontieria, but whether or not Ufi might be an opportunity uh, to look at mitigating the, the growth of the lake weed. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Yeah, actually, the, the, the Ufi, the, the mats, um, the weed mats, um, I know that they have been working in reasonably um, tight areas, let's call it, you know, sort of geographically small areas, uh, to, to, to consider an area of, or to consider the size of some of these weed beds, you know, Kawaha Point and areas like that. It's certainly, you can, I think you can control localised sort of problem areas. I'm not too sure how it might work in Otorua if there was enough Ufi to go around to sort out the Rotorua situation, I'm sure we'd be, uh, we'd be happy to try and implement it if we could. Thank you. Uh, Mr Waru. Kia ora nōra tātou. E anaru, te nā koe. Kwa te mea te kia ko, e tēnei tūngai te mōhio, ko te rui a koe tēnei tūranga. E tūranga nui, te mahi ngā mahi rotu te kaunihea. So um, Anadu could see here, see you there, and, uh, and I remember when you came nine years ago. Hey, my way, I'm a Kuru Koshele, I'm a Otamari. And I'm a Irena Katsutaki Taki Aita, I'm a Tofano. So um, good to have you on board, and I'm very, very happy, and, and indeed, Setata Wotarawa are happy, but it will be out within Naturanga. So I think, um, again, Councillor Yates might have uh, stolen my thunder a little bit uh, with the question. So it was around um, what, what has uh, um, Lake's Trust or where does Lake's Trust fit into the, to the mould and also, um, you know, with another iwi hat on, um, we need to ensure that their lake, our lakefront, um, because it was pretty putrid and I agree with the council of Italy, it was down there, especially um, when I was overseeing our build um, for this, our spa, or and also the other things we intend to build there as well, and, and I think we need to come up with a, a bit more of a plan uh, around, you know, not just go waiting for it to happen. And you know, that took a week to ten days to, to clear out, and it was, and it wrecked. So I just want to urge, um, urge us to come up with a very robust plan, and don't underestimate the mass over on the mass. You know, it's not just about the weed; there are a number of other factors, like sediment and things like that, that are affecting the flow of the lake. And, you know, we used to have a power and I said, oh, we're going really wet. And when certain winds and things happened, it would end up there, and really, really was another way to stay home. It sunk because the weed would come up. Not, not so much like now, but we, we know how to handle these things. Uh, and I just want to put that forward as well. So, um, uh, and saying that too, Anaru, Pasai Kiawe, what's your priority? What would you say is your top three priorities at the moment? Say nine. 
how, how will they identify? We, we might give you a bit more time before you have to answer that one, Anuru, but we would look forward to hearing it from you. If there's anything that you want to say personally, then, Papai. Yeah, thanks for that, Aldi. I um, appreciate the question. I think right now, um, clearly, community safety is, uh, is, is hot on my mind um, and what that looks like given my 20-year background in policing. Um, I am concerned, uh, but also can see opportunity. Um, at the moment, just getting a lot of situation awareness and bring myself up to speed with the priorities for the Tudua. But certainly that features strongly in my mind. Um, and so you're just real current state, understanding the current state so I can understand what their desired future state might look like and those deployment decisions and, and seeing what other partners we need in regards to bring those um, plans to life and certainly from my perspective um, Rauri Te Te Tau Tarawa I'll be knocking on the door in regards to what good looks like in regards to community safety so top of my mind at the moment would be uh, would be that um, and certainly supporting um, our colleagues uh, my colleagues uh, the executive so you know, really early days for me but if I'm thinking about what's um, what I can see um, that's what I see at the moment. Kia ora. Kia ora. And I just wondered, um, Councillor Bentley, you did raise the uh, question earlier and we've had a bit of an update uh, from Rob now, but was there anything else that uh, you wish to add? No, I don't think I can verbalise it. I'm probably up for a code of conduct breach if I verbalise what I'm thinking. Okay, then we'll keep it there. Thank you, uh, Councillor Bentley. Your Worship, the Mayor. I'll follow up. Um, welcome, Anaru, and um, I'm pleased to hear you say community safety is actually the top priority. Um, and there are lots of small meetings that we've been asked to go to um, neighbourhood support or the Lakes community meetings where this was an issue raised of many of those. So. It would be great when we get the opportunity to look at um, what are the strategic responses that we should focus on in community safety. Um, and I look forward to working with you there because we've all got to collaborate on that. Um, but Rob, could I just ask the question that um, I, I, I think it was on Councillor Bentley's lips, but he didn't say it. Did we respond quickly enough? Or do we make it quite difficult in terms of we've got to go to Tiarawa Lakes Trust to get approval to get regional council involved to get the stuff out? And I know it's still building and it could still wave in, uh, but did we re did we react quickly enough? Uh, through you, Madam Chair. The uh, yeah, it's, it's a good question. I mean, we had um, we had. It, there was a discussion earlier um, about Infocore's role in weed clearing and while it's not on what we consider to be their bullet quantities, we do use them for weed clearing. Uh, so Infocore and the weed cutter boat or the weed harvester were pretty much activated within, um, I think it was 48 hours because the boat had to come in from another site and be cleaned and there wasn't a lot of point in getting into the embayment until the weed cutter boat had got some of the weed from outside the embayment. Um, so we should be able to activate quicker than that, um, you know, but it was the fact the boat was, was sort of located elsewhere and had to come in. Um, then we will be working harder on making sure we've got an ongoing program so that we can just keep at it with Infocore. So they've been working on making it on their equipment to get onto the boardwalk better. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's a good question. And the thing is that um, there is a, a time window when we can do this as well and get the best, and it was just being able to get in close to the shoreline. It, it's something that had been considered and, and had worked out with the planning and the design of the infocore, uh, sorry, the design of the boardwalk. So the boardwalk was designed with this ability to be able to manage these sorts of events uh, and now we're getting our program refined to be able to deal with them. Thank you. Thank you. I might just get the Chief Executive to make a comment on this as well, please. Yeah. 
Thank you. Through, through the Chair. Look, Andrew and, and I and Rob have had quite a long discussion about some of this project. And mm -hmm. Rob is reflecting to you that, that he's been looking at the systems and processes and approaches mm -hmm. that we use for cleaning up this sort of an event. One of the challenges, though, of course, that we've got is that this isn't a usual event. This is the result of a cyclone. And one of the one of the clear things is that yes, we could have cleaned it up incredibly quickly if we had three or four weed harvesters on on tap to be able to put into the lake, and immediately the following day start cleaning. The the reality though is that from a cost point of view, it's prohibitive. Uh, we we just as an organisation wouldn't actually see that having the level of investment to clean up what are very unusual events overnight it is a proper use of ratepayer funding. What we need to do is to make sure that on frequent events that occur, for example, on a, on a regular cyclic basis or every month or every three or every six months, those are the sort of things that we do need to have the capacity and Rob is working very much on that to ensure that we're able to respond. But when we get incredibly unusual events of a cyclone from blowing from the north at 80 kilometres an hour and having to deal with, I think the figure was 500 tonnes of, of weed rob and, and 100 or 1,000 cubic metres of, of weed, just simply these sort of things are going to actually take time. And I think no matter how good we get at this, the, the expectation that we're going to have this these sort of events cleaned up in an incredibly fast order is probably beyond our ability to actually meet the resourcing requirements of it. For that answer, and can I say, as the, as the Mayor, when there is a cyclone like this, the first port of call is to Stavros about are the roads, you know, are there trees down, are there roofs blown off, are there, it was that bad, um, and then in came the lakeweed. But I agree that long term we need to look at how the heck we get this out because it is an impact of climate change as well. And so we've got to make sure we've got a, a, a look at that plan about the in-lake solution. And Rob does know the ecology of the in-lake um, ecology because of your background, Rob, and I appreciate that. And I do remember the questions when we developed the lakefront plan I think it was yourself, Councillor Tetzel, that asked, you know, how are we going to cope with incursions of lakeweed? Well, here we are, but this is bigger than we expected. So I hope the public is a little bit tolerant about the um, aesthetic value that, of the place we love and also um, the impact, you know, sensory. It's not nice, but no one realised there was that much lakeweed churning away out in the centre of the lake. And, and ironically, tonight is the Lakes Water Quality AGM. So no doubt it'll be a topic at the AGM, and it's good that it's getting some air time today. Uh, thank, thank you, Councillor Bentley, because I think this is living in Rotorua uh, with our number of lakes. And the question for me with the Lakes Water Quality Programme is we, have we given enough emphasis to Lake Rotorua as a prime lake? Well, thank you very much. I think there has been plenty of discussion on the lake weed. We still have Councillor Kumar, Ropawate and then Donaldson, um, but there, if there are any other questions on the report um, from page 49 to page uh, 63, then please let me know, otherwise we will move on. Councillor Kumar. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Anaru, for your introduction. I'm looking forward to working alongside you and um, for the well-being of the community. Rob? I really appreciate your thorough um, explanation about what's it, because when it came out in the newspaper, the layman picked up the newspaper and think, saying, nobody's doing anything. So what you've detailed today is, is very respectable, that the media are correct what, how they address the issue. Um, so thank you very much for that. I've got just a couple of things. One question is, um, we are going to soon open up again as a destination to Aucklanders and the rest of the world. Um, I don't encourage dogs and little terriers running around the city, but um, is it at some time we're going to look at uh, seeing how our bylaws are with regards to if we are to promote our city um, around the dog issues? 
And the other issue that I have is um, another issue. My other question is is parking. Uh, hopefully, you can. We'll, we'll just get Kurt, our yeah. manager, um, to answer the question around dog. Mm -hmm. Kia ora. thank you, Councillor Kuma. Uh, so, in relation to the, the dog bylaw, uh, that comes up again to start the review process, and that, and I stress that to start that process in September this year, just as part of the um, the bylaw review pro um, rollover. Thank you. The reason I uh, spoke about the dog one is because I see the amount of registration for dogs. So there's a lot of serious dog lovers out there, and I'm, I'm sure they would like to. So to see some uh, lacks in that uh, for them to bring them into the city. The other thing I heard is that uh, our night markets are not in operation at the moment, and that's because of the mandate in the red light district. Are we in the future going to come back to where we are, uh, where we were, or are we? Thank you for that question, uh, Councillor Kumar. Unfortunately. Um Stuart Brown's not here today, but if we can take that question offline and come back to you, um, we'll have an answer for you. Thank you. Hmm. Thank you. Councillor Rokawate. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's really uh, just in relation to the lakefront and the, um, the weed there. You know, it's, it's quite obvious with the number of people going to the lake now, because it is stunning and people walk around there, so we should be expecting people to ring in and say they're concerned. So I don't think we should get overly anxious about that. The thing, about, thing that has come to my attention recently, so I just want to let that one lie on the table, is actually around the markets and people are saying, why are they closed when they're out, outdoors? And I mean, this is the Saturday one and also, um, well, all our markets actually, because someone went the other day, I was at Hastings or Fielding actually, and, and they're all open and they're all outside and what, why aren't we? And I, I was just wanting to ask the question, as you, Councillor Kumar, are they due to get back on as soon as possible? Because we are living with, we're living with what we've got in terms of our COVID response. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rokawate. Um, I'm sure many agree with that as well. So um, we'll take that feedback back and see what we can do. And just bearing in mind that the reason for it being uh, closed was just to protect the health and safety of not only the operators, but those who may be visiting. But we shall find a way to keep going through. Um, thank you for your concerns. Councillor Donaldson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Through you, mine's probably for Kurt. Um, and <clears throat> I just want to acknowledge the wider role that Safe City Guardians are performing. Um, uh, and so they're not focused solely on the CBD. And it was uh, page 52 and 3 of the report, and that inspired piece of work of flying the drone at night over a sanatorium reserve um, because as a regular user of that as a commuting route, um, Madam Chair, there was a recent fire around one of these campsites right beside the poor arena that took out a patch of uh, um, <coughs> Manuka right adjacent to the cycleway. So um, I just wanted to know, with Sanatorium Reserve, because the danger is not just to the campers but to users of the reserve of fire and that sort of thing, um, will this be a, a regular ongoing um, piece of, of work to monitor uh, campsites and occupation in, in the Sanatorium Reserve? Uh, absolutely. So, um, you, and I'm pleased that you've picked up on that as, as a bit of an innovative approach to address what has been a problem for some time. Um, we have done this piece of work uh, as a way of seeing how we can keep a better eye on that area uh, for the safety of those users, for the potential fire risks, like you say, uh, but also importantly to help look after our staff in that area. It's not a, a when they're going and investigating these things. It's not a particularly safe area for anybody that is choosing to sleep there or for our staff to be tramping through the, the vegetation and the geothermal. So, so definitely um, there was a trial to determine the effectiveness and to uh, all going well to look at incorporating that going forward into how we address that particular issue. Thank you, Madam Chair. Excellent. Thank you. And final question from Councillor Yates. Uh, thank you. Through you, Madam Chair. Nei rā te mihi anō. Heo anō. Ko tēnei mea rā ko te lakefront. 
Um, I would just like to, mine's more of a comment and a compliment actually. So I noticed that the um, work that the Puoro art piece that Lionel had designed for the basketball half court has now been completed. So that's just an acknowledgement for that area being done. Rob, Safe City Guardians, I see them walking the whole stretch of Fenton Street, Nate Arts in Mahi. Also to uh, Laura and our library team, fantastic to finally have Great Tarawa Stories, a resource that was built for our local schools, now in the hands of Te Apamori, Kartika, and around the Shimpak, it's just amazing. I just can't wait to see that, but the roof is now on. There's a whole lot of work going on there, and we really do need to keep up the positivity when it comes to the great things that are going to come to our city. So, Nera Kumihiki Akoto, nine days in, and you're also already getting some tips, Te Anaru. Kia kaha tato. Kia tika to korero, Messia. Kia ora. Um, well, that uh, will bring that presentation to a close, but thank you very much, and we look forward to seeing those significant projects continue. Thank you. Thank you, Anaru. We now move to our final uh, GCE group, in, uh, Infrastructure and Environmental Solutions. We invite Davros Michael up, and we are on page 63 of our agenda. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll take the report as read um, and respond to any questions uh, elected members may have. Just wanted to highlight two or three things. Uh, obviously, as you heard earlier, uh, our primary focus as, as a group at this point in time is to maintain um, business continuity planning, uh, the reliability and safety of our services. I think Councillor Kumar asked earlier about the availability of rats or rapid antigen tests for our staff. Uh, it's important to know that we actually do have staff that have been infected, uh, and either themselves or uh, members of their families, and they need to be you know, staying with them for isolation. So we continuously look into and improvise uh, ways to distribute both our own staff and our contractors in a way that ensures the reliability of the service, the water supply, sewage and so on. So that's an ongoing part and parcel of our business community plan. Another thing that we have been focusing attention obviously is despite all the delays and supplies and so on, we do have some deadlines to achieve with the uh, Crown Infrastructure Programs and the Department of Internal Affairs funding we receive. Uh, for June this year and June uh, 2023. So we are busy delivering those um, uh, capital works programs that allowed us you know, to get funding from these entities. And I think we are progressing there despite you know, any delays in terms of materials and in terms of our resources. Uh, we continue to implement the detailed design and property visit in Lake Tarawera. Uh, we have visited about 90% of the properties to date, and we expect to have a detailed design for a report to Council in early May, uh, and that is progressing together with the funding group. We monitor the three waters reforms, uh, and obviously, as um, Thomas said earlier, uh, the intention for the, waste, for the water services bill is not going to Parliament until mid this year, which I will dictate in our final approach to that. Uh, we're working with uh, a number of partners you know, to explore options for improvement for both industrial, commercial and residential development towards airport, the airport you know, uh, intersection. We also work with Waka Kotahi and Pekka Block, the Manafenwa there, and Red Stark to improve the state highway intersections for those areas because it will be critical to allow us to achieve commercial, industrial, recreational, and environmental outcomes in, a, uh, in that respect. So we're bringing together a number of parties to explore um, how we can collaborate in, and achieve those kind of results. And the final point, you will notice in my reports, now we are not responding to the Ministry of Health's uh, mandated fluoridation of our water. Uh, we have provided to them uh, in response our estimate for the capital cost required to equip our nine uh, water supplies with appropriate fluoridation equipment and monitoring. And we'll wait to hear from them over the next few weeks whether they are prepared to put some uh, funding assistance to that respect. 
Uh, so, I mean, Port of Tarua will not complain with that at this point in time. None of our water supplies include flood irrigation, but obviously with the mandate from the health department, that will become something over the next 12 to 18 months you know, to be implemented. So we'll try to get some financial assistance you know, to that aspect. Thank you. Thank you, Stavros, and thank you for the heads up on the fluoridation. Were there any questions on this report? Uh, Mr. Hurd. Thank you, Madam Chair. My question relates to refuse collection on page 73, 9.6.2, where we talk about picking up um, refuse on sealed roads but not unsealed. My question is, when a road is sealed, does, do we automatically pick up the garbage on that sealed road or not? And if so, why are Puaiki Road and Hoko Road residents still not getting their stuff picked up at the gate, the bins? Uh, thank you, through you, Madam Chair, and I'm sure the Chair of the Rural Community Board uh, will uh, provide more uh, in-depth uh, uh, assistance to that. When we went to the uh, community consultation uh, last year with regards to extending the rural waste collections, uh, the agreement through the consultation process where unsealed roads were to be excluded and as they get sealed, uh, a consultation would take place with individual parties who live on those roads to see whether they want to be included into the system and to increase the targeted rate. Now, I can't tell you exactly at the moment what, what stage we are, but if you have a, each one of the roads contains, let's say, a number of properties, the, um, the chair of the community board and our staff are working together to ask those people now the road has been sealed, would you like the service to be extended to, to you know, your side? Because I think it would be a little bit sort of um, heavy-handed if we went and imposed the service without actually talking to the residents because they need to incur the tax at the levy. Uh, so we are in the process and we are fully aware that as we extend seal extensions, and obviously we need to bring these parties, you know, provided they wanted to, into the you know, collection service. Thank you. Your Worship. Mine's a slightly more esoteric um, question, Stavros, about the IPCC climate change report that was released internationally where we've seen the national response seems to be we've got to do more. When you look at our um, infrastructure plan and our resilience plan, what on earth could we do that is more? Um. To you, Madam Chair, uh, Your Worship, you know, I mean, obviously, in uh, the context of the international uh, factors, you know, we are very small, you know, uh, input. However, I think we've got, we're doing a number of things. So one, obviously, with the, you know, IPCC reports, uh, uh, there are climate change effects we need to adjust to, and now our stormwater master, master plan is a significant component of that. Third thing, of course, is reducing our own emissions, and as you are aware, we have made significant efforts over the recent years to reduce our emissions. I mean, from our waste, for example, we create, we are now about 50% is fully diverted, and if you go to the full um, organic and green waste collections, you know, in about 18 months' time, we'll be down to about 25% of our waste mm -hmm. in landfill, which mm -hmm. means, you know, it's 75% oh, of all our waste gets put to beneficial use, reducing emissions. Uh, and of course, the third thing in the IPCC report, you know, and I probably, I'm talking big picture stuff here too, it's apparent that one of the best efforts we can make is to improve the economic resiliency of our population. And you're doing a significant amount of work in that direction in terms of encouraging economic activity, housing, uh, uh, building, construction, um, entertainment, and so on. So I think the more, the more, the more economically uh, prowess is a community, the more resilient they are in the effects of climate change. So I think we're doing everything we can uh, at this point in time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stavros. Well, there appears to be no further questions. Thank you for your report. Um, I now uh, need a resolution to go into public ex 
excluded. Um, I'd like to advise that there are two items for consideration in the session. Uh, first of all, the confidential minutes from the Operations and Monitoring Committee meeting held on the 3rd of February. And secondly, a contract approval for Minor Works Transport Network 2022-25. The reason is to ensure commercial sensitivity. Um, were you wanting to be a mover, Councillor Johnson, or do you have a question? I did have a question for the Chief Executive before we went into public exclusion, if that's possible, Madam Chair. Just on the whole um, operational report. Okay. Councillor Donaldson, and did you have a question too, Councillor? Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, I just would like the Chief Executive perhaps to reflect on the um, the appointment of the seven Deputy Chief Executives and the, the work that is reflected both in the local electoral bill, the, uh, the work that's been done in the infrastructure area around MFE funding to progress wastewater um, projects at PACE and, and other infrastructure projects, and also the work that was done uh, around bringing together the housing and business development assessment over the holiday period when yourself, you were on leave and, and away on, on other reasons. Um, it just, to me, um, shows, I think, the, uh, the degree of autonomy that those roles have in this organisation and perhaps some comment from you about how you see that work because I know certain vehicles were really out of this car park over that holiday period and working hard. Thank you for the question. I think I think the I think the question has actually got an answer built into it as well to some degree. Look, I, it's not only the level of challenge around us. We've got business as usual expectations, and then on top of that, business as usual challenges, such as the large weed event that we talked about previously. On top of that, we've got a level of of uncertainty around us with regard to central government reforms of, of different processes around the organisation. We're dealing with a, a pandemic and the uncertainties around that, but also the impact that, that is very real for us having, and you heard earlier on about the number of staff who we have away from this organisation. On top of that, we've got um, work going on in partnership with the DHB about how we can assist with regards to the delivery of rapid, rapid antigen jet tests. You know, and, and look, the list goes on and on. I think the, the impressive thing from my point of view is that at the end of the day, this organisation is here for the Rotorua community and to do everything we can to support the community in whatever areas that, that we can offer assistance in. Quite simply, if we had a, a traditional hierarchical approach which actually channeled everything through the Chief Executive and relied on me singularly to provide the level of leadership across the level of demand that, that we have in front of us, we fundamentally would not be responding with the speed or the breadth that we are today. I'm, I'm really delighted with the work that our DCEs are doing. They, they were set up in a role to provide their own leadership, their own direction, to be able to provide advocacy through to central government, to be able to respond to challenges as they arise, and have the, if they have the ability to be, to be able to do so without actually a highly bureaucratic organisation that's actually constraining them. They are reporting to you on a regular basis. You are being informed. So, you know, to me, the, the level of capacity of the organisation has actually stepped up quite considerably. For those of you who are on the local, um, the panel looking at the future of local government, the first question that this organisation got was about what have we done with regards to our executive structure. That was their first thought. And what they were talking about was the move away from traditional management responsibilities to actually leading to outcomes. And, and I think the, the clear indication that we got from them was that this seems to be a step for the future of local government. Thank you. I would like to follow that up, if I may, and thank you. 
um, in a day for, for putting your comments to the chief executive. I was on that call the other day with the mayor and a, a couple of other councillors, and it is obvious that, um, count, that because we were asked what is the future of local government and so we gave our views but it is obvious that there are some people who have sat around the table over recent years we don't have to go back too far and believe that council is just business as usual and that we can ask stupid and dumb questions without actually being totally informed about what is the work of council and you know we have to lift our expectations and certainly by what the structures that you've put in place, Jeff, allows us to see that the big picture is actually being addressed and that, you know, that, you're, that our, the senior leadership team are not head down, bum up, in the, right in the detail that they have to keep that helicopter view in mind. And also we want to make sure that we're not just about the roads and, and the rubbish and, and water. We actually are about the well-being of our, uh, of our community, of our citizens, and that's everybody, not just the uptown folks whose voices have always been heard in the past, and you'll always hear me say that, because we know who they are, but we have to have a well community, and that includes everybody in our community. So I found that, um, I found uh, listening and getting some feedback uh, from the people in Wellington who were on that panel with us. I found it very enlightening, and I can say that we are on the right road, and we're probably ahead of most of the other councils, councils uh, in the country. That's just my observation. <laughs> a very tidy bit, and for those who are wondering, it is a little bit off agenda, but we are going through a significant reform of the future um, of local government, which of course is the call that Jeff Williams was on as a follow-up this morning. So, uh, final brief comments yeah, from your Briefly, um, I was also on that call and I was intrigued that the panel chose to come to Rotorua first because they knew we were doing something different. And that was what so interested them about how are we working in partnership and collaboratively. All councillors, community board and Te Tato were all invited to participate and that is the richest sort of forum that we could be in to influence the change that will happen in Wellington. So it was great and I was incredibly proud when I heard them say we chose to come to Rotorua because you're daring to do something different about the well-being of your people in Rotorua. So well done executive team. Thank you. Well, um, I've read out the resolution. We're going in a confidential to confirm some minutes and go over a contract approval. Um, the reason being to ensure commercial sensitivity. May I please have a mover and a seconder? Moved by Councillor Wang, seconded by Councillor Rokola-Tape. All those in favour, please say aye. Thank you.